We've got we have corn, so I'm going to go ahead and start. All right. Good evening, everyone. So welcome to our PVUSD uh, board meeting. We do have translation available in Spanish. Um, so if you need that support, please see Orania Lopez. Uh, tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Orania Lopez. And if you would like to speak to an item on the agenda, um, please complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria uh, prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. So um, we'll move on to item 3.2, our Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask uh, Vice President Acosta to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so moving on to item 3.3. Um, instead of our usual uh, superintendent comments, uh, Dr. Rodriguez let me know that there were some uh, folks here from uh, Assembly Member Rivas and Addis's office and Supervisor Hernandez, oh, Supervisor Hernandez is here, and uh, Mayor Montesino. So um, if you wanted to come and speak, come up to the podium and speak to Violations great top <laughs> and jeans. It is a gray area. <laughs> Someone coordinated. <laughs> so it's always good to be here, and you know, it's uh, we're gonna miss Michelle, of course, and, and we got this proclamation from the Board of Supervisors that I want to read a little bit of. Uh, I won't read it all, but I'll read a little bit of it. Well, I might read it all. It's not that long. Uh, <laughs> Whereas Dr. Michelle Rodriguez was hired on August 2016 as superintendent of schools for the Power Valley Unified School District, and during her time at PBUSD, she has proved to be an educational leader with deep integrity who consistently uses her equity lens. And whereas Dr. Rodriguez launched the framework of whole child and whole family, whole community, as well as multiple measures of student success to accelerate change, address structural inequities, and ignite learning driven by students, passion, and interest. Whereas Dr. Rodriguez brought innovative educational practices and research, including systemic instruction and phenom awareness, phonics and sight words, uh, SIPs, and footsteps to brilliance, which has led to growing and increase in student achievement in many areas of PVUSD. Whereas Dr. Rodriguez help bring in the district's first multilingual, multicultural, and multi-agency family engagement and wellness center, offering after school and weekend hours to ensure vulnerable students and families, physical, mental health, and social services needs were being met throughout through direct services. Dr. Rodriguez, along with school site leadership, school families, community members, donors, foundations, and community partner organizations in agriculture, culinary, and health sectors invested and built one of the only five specialized garden and culinary education installations in the entire United States, catalyzed by a grant by the Emerald, Emerald Lagasse Foundation, Emerald culinary, Emerald's Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen at Starlight Elementary, which serves as the central hub for large-scale rollout of 16 elementary schools in collaboration with Life Lab. Dr. Rodriguez developed important relationships with the community, government, and nonprofit leaders to build community partnerships of 96 organizations and agencies that uplift PVUSD and district priorities at the local and county, regional, state, and national arenas 
to advocate for equity of outcomes and education and for the most vulnerable students. Now, therefore, I, Felipe Hernandez, Santa Cruz County 4th District Supervisor, hereby honor Dr. Michelle Rodriguez for her educational leadership, innovative new educational programs, and for developing a strong relationship with the community to benefit PVUSD students and their families. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I was just looking at, you know, you have lots of accomplishments because they're not the same. <laughs> uh, um, so, whereas uh, uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, Superintendent of uh, Schools for the Paro Valley Unified School District, has been a remarkable leader, possess, uh, possessing rare talents, deep integrity, and persistent equity lens. And whereas Dr. Rodriguez has been dedicated to students in urban and rural low, low socioeconomic districts for over 30 years where they focus on vulnerable uh, student population and whereas Dr. Rodriguez launched the framework of whole child, whole family, and whole community to express the concentric uh, and, uh, and connected layers of work and transform PVDOZ student, family, and community systems initiatives to accelerate change and whereas in 2016 PVUSD has witnessed remarkable growth and achievement in many areas as Dr. Rodriguez brought perspective and awareness of innovative and forward-facing educational practices and research including systematic instruction of phonemic awareness, phonics and sight words and um, footprints and brilliance and whereas additionally the district's full multi um, Lingual, multicultural, and multi agency family engagement and wellness center open offering the after school and weekend hours to ensure vulnerable uh, students and families' physical and mental and social services need are being met. And whereas in recent years, PVUSD has achieved steadily increased recl uh, reclassification rates for PVUSD English learners, and in 2023, graduate rates of all three comprehensive high schools was the highest ever achieved in the district. Optus High uh, High School 97%, Pajaro Valley High School 95%, and Watsonville High S School 94%. And whereas Dr. Rodriguez has been recognized for excellence in leadership through 2022 ACSA Superintendent of the Year for 2020, Community Health Trust um, Rather Awards 2019, United Way Community Hero Award, um, in 2019, uh, Broad Fellowship in 2020, CDE, Community Engagement Initiative Selection, and whereas Dr. Rodriguez developed important relationships with community government and nonprofit leaders to build a community partner ecosystem of 90 cents organizations, agencies, and up agencies that are uplifted students and enable PVG to educate for the future of they deserve. Now, therefore, I, Eduardo Montesino, the, uh, the mayor of the city of Watsonville and the state of California, on behalf of the city council, um, do hereby wish Dr. Rodriguez the best in her future endeavors. So, thank you. Just want to I, I, I say, I mean, you created a lot of partnerships over the over the years with the with all the communities. So, I just want to thank you for all of what you're doing, it. and especially during the pandemic years, which was a challenge in getting everyone. You know, uh, you know, laptops, getting all that organized, and a lot of people that did not have access to Wi-Fi, you provided that access. I just want to thank you on behalf of the community. Okay, my turn. I'll skip the whereases. Uh, you know, thinking back to elementary years, you know, there was often times on that first day a task students would sometimes get. You get a piece of paper and you write down, where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years, 20 years? I'm sure on your first day, if you had had a piece of paper, you never could have imagined the roller coaster you were about to endure. You know, you may have been familiar with the digital divide, but you probably couldn't have foreseen the impact it was about to have as you took on this role in the coming years. You certainly couldn't have foreseen a pandemic that comes, flips school districts overnight upside down. Couldn't have realized that with the effects of climate change, you'd see orange skies. 
that would even lead to days where sometimes students would have to stay home. Floods. There's no way on that first day you could have ever recorded that. But you still had to help navigate that. And it truly is a testament to not only your leadership and the team that you helped lead and build that you've been able to get through this. And while I'm sure people are disappointed that you may be leaving today, there is at least one silver lining. It's when people come to a place like Pajaro, they can certainly take the lessons learned here and share them in other regions, but also let people know that in rural areas like ours that face so many challenges, we can surely succeed. And so as you go on to, to new and other exciting adventures, hopefully not as momentous, please let them know that communities like this certainly can thrive, uh, and please don't forget what it is that was learned here. So on behalf of the state delegation, uh, the assembly members Robert Rivas, Don Addis, Gail Pellerin, Senators Caballero, uh, and Laird, we would just like to present you uh, with this resolution recognizing you. Thank you for that. President Holm, we have one public speaker to this item. Okay. Leslie DeRose. Hi, Dr. Rodriguez and board. Um, um, Leslie DeRose, former trustee. Um, sorry, I was unable to make um, your celebration last night. So I thought I would just come and just express my thoughts personally about my time um, working with you here at PVUSD, I'm glad these proclamations came forward because I couldn't remember everything. I knew the list was huge and long. So um, I just wanted to say I was very honored to be on the board with Kim um, as the board that hired you. And I just, I reflect back on uh, when we did the site visit in Santa Ana. I will never forget uh, interviewing your former board members and community members. And many people had tears that they were losing you. And um, I'm sure that's happened here. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say thank you for always, always, always putting students first. Uh, there's many voices we know that need to be heard, um, sometimes conflicting, but you had an amazing talent of putting student achievement first, even when it was really tough and maybe not popular um, with groups, but you did it. And it was just amazing to watch. Um, how those decisions rolled out into increasing student achievement more than I had ever seen, um, and probably many of our community members had seen. So I just want to say thank you. You will be missed, but the work that you put into this district will have a very long-lasting effect, whether people know it or not. It's because of the work that you did. Thank you very much. We'll move on to governing board comments, uh, reports on standing committee meetings. So this is our opportunity for board members to make a few comments, and we'll start with Trustee Dodge, Jr. I know we have a long meeting. I just wanted to say that July 8th, the Watsonville High School, we're having a car show. Um, Coach Gregorio and the Watsonville High administration is putting a car show. All types of cars are invited. Um, they're raising money for 
new Watsonville High School football uniforms, and there'll be barbecue for sale and music, and hopefully you can come out to Watsonville High on Saturday and support Watsonville High School football. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Flores? Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I don't have much to say. I had, um, oh, actually, I do. I'm sorry. We did have an intergovernmental um, meeting. It was um, cut a little short. We did um, intend to speak about our SRO um, program here, and it was put off until the next meeting. So hopefully I will have um, some more information for you guys at our next quarterly meeting regarding that. And also, um, I want to say thank you again to Clint and um, his team for the amazing budget meeting that we were able to have um, last weekend. I hope, you know, if you haven't been able to watch it, that you have a, t a chance to watch it. It was very informative. Thank you. Vice President Acosta. Yes, uh, we do have a very packed agenda and have to return to closed session this evening. So I'm, for the most part, going to just yield my comments. I will just say, yes, thank you to our CBO, Clint Rucker, and his team for the meeting, the special study session on the 17th. Appreciative of that and IT for the help, you know. We were having some major sound issues, but um, we got through it. Um, and on that, I hope everybody's having a great summer. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, yesterday, I attended the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance meeting, and um, we participated in a, an evaluation of our current um, executive and it went very well and so I'm very pleased and proud to be uh, to serve on that board which helps with mental health needs of children and youth and families in the Pajaro Valley. Um, I've already I think made remarks about Dr. Rodriguez but I'll just say briefly that I'm, we're really going to miss you and I am one of those people with tears in my eyes. You did a great job and I'm just excited for you to um, do your thing in Stockton and congratulations to Stockton Unified. And I'm an optimist always, and so I look forward to um, another wonderful person in your seat to help build on the, the progress that you've made. So thank you so much, Michelle. Trustee Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you once again for attending tonight. Um, I'll keep my comments brief as well. I just want to wish Dr. Rodriguez a, a hearty adieu. Um, best of luck in your endeavors. Um, you leave us with a void, but uh, you know, with with some cooperation and maybe some good applicants or s someone will be able to fill your shoes. It's going to be a tough one because I don't think they make shoes big enough for that person coming in. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, you know, good luck to you, and I hope you. Uh, do for Stockton what you were able to do for Watsonville. Thank you. Oh, Trustee Scott. Yes, good evening everybody and to everybody watching us on the YouTube. Um, we had another great meeting uh, ahead of us. A uh, couple notes. I, I do want to note that the Watsonville City Council has uh, unanimously endorsed uh, a resolution that farmland near our city and schools go organic, which is a very positive thing for those of us who are concerned about pesticide exposure. Um, and so I'm excited about that and, and at some point I'd like to bring that to the school board to discuss that. Um, also want to thank Dr. Rodriguez. Wish you well. Thank you for all your great work here. I know in the, you're an arts advocate as am I and this Friday I wanted to invite everybody. Um, I've been coaching uh, the summer orchestra intensive at Watsonville High School for PVUSD kids. And we're going to have our two weeks. Uh, we're going to have a show on Friday at 4:30 p.m. at the Watsonville City Library. That's this Friday at 4:30 p.m. Thank you. So this is our last board meeting together. And um, in the over five years that I've been coming to these meetings, I have watched you grow as a leader, and you are a force to be reckoned with. And that is not always easy for a woman in our society. But you're not somebody who looks for the easy way. You're somebody who looks for the best and the right way. And we don't have to agree on what that right best way is for me to honor and respect that. Um, a good leader is irreplaceable. A great leader leaves behind a strong platform for others to build on what comes next. And you've done that. 
And I wish you and the Stockton Unified School District community, you know, all the very best in the chapter that is ahead of you. And thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we will move on to item 4.1, approval of the agenda. My understanding is that staff is requesting to pull item 9.15 for further review. So can I have a motion to approve the agenda, um, removing item 9.1? Make a motion Five. to approve the agenda, removing item 9.15. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, 7-0. Um, going on to item 5.1, approval of the June 14th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? All right, I have second. a motion. Second. I have first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, 7-0. Can I have a um, item? 5.2, approval of the June 17th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. I have a second. First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, we will move on to our action items. The first is our superintendent search firm presentations for permanent uh, superintendent by leadership associates in McPherson and Jacobson, LLC. So the report will be presented by um, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez and let's see how are, are we, which one are we doing? Um, McPherson and Jacobson will be okay. first. Great. So before the board tonight, you will be hearing um, two of the um, top superintendent search firms. So um, the first that we'll be presenting is McPherson and Jacobson. They will have approximately 20 minutes to engage with you all. And then there will be a second presentation um, and then there will be time for discussion as well. Um, we do have the two firms separated, so at this point, um, only McPherson, McPherson and Jacobson are in the room, and I will allow them to uh, introduce themselves, so thank you. Thank you very much, and we'd like to open up with our congratulations to you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, and it sounds like your tenure here and the, the footsteps you're leaving behind are really powerful, so congratulations to you. Uh, I'm Daniel Moreo, and uh, my partner is uh, Penny de Leon, and uh, we will introduce more of ourselves in just a moment, but we do represent McPherson and Jacobson. Good. Okay, wonderful. Do I, uh, am I advancing? Yes, I am. How are you doing? <laughs> so McPherson and Jacobson is very proud to be endorsed by the California School Boards Association. Um, and as you can see here is our, the executive director, Vernon Billy, and that means a lot to us. Um, a CSBA is a trusted leader for school boards up and down the state of California, so to have their endorsement is meaningful to us. So thank you for that. And then I'm next. And then um, just wanted to share with you our belief statement. We uh, truly do believe that every student is entitled to a high quality education the very best education we can possibly give them as educators. And in order to do that, we absolutely believe that you must have a high quality leader. So our mission in McPherson and Jacobson is to um, ensure that the results of the search will yield a high quality leader, an outstanding and transformational leader for Pajaro Valley, since you do have such big shoes to fill. As I've already mentioned, I'm Daniel Moreo. I would be one of your consultants uh, representing you um, uh, with the search. Uh, my history is that I've been a superintendent in a variety of districts. I've been in a uh, suburban, urban, uh, and rural school districts myself. Matter of fact, I was the state administrator in the Mo South Monterey County uh, School District a number of years ago before we were able to return local control to them. I've been doing searches now with McPherson and Jacobson for about four years. I've done about 12 searches uh, myself. Um, so it feels somewhat conversant. 
Hello, I'm Dr. Penelope De Leon. Um, I'm very um, pleased to uh, present to you this evening. I have 30 years as a public school educator, um, going up through the ranks from teacher all the way through superintendent. This is my seventh year as a seated superintendent. Um, and my first superintendency was actually many years in the Oxnard Union High School District, which is also an agricultural community. And so I very deeply understand the uniquities of um, of your community and um, and very thrilled to be here tonight to present to you. The two of us together will be your uh, main consultants, uh, although we have access to a nationwide set of consultants. One of the couple of pieces about us is that we are in fact a leading national firm. By default, if we become your uh, consultants of choice, you will automatically get national exposure because McPherson and Jacobs is a national firm. Um, and as a result, we also have consultants across the country, many here in California, but we also have uh, folks across the country that we're able to tap into and talk about as candidates come forward. We typically do get candidates from other states. Actually, the last search I did, we actually had a few from Canada. So uh, we get them from uh, across the globe, I guess. Uh, we've got a variety of background qualifications. Most of us uh, have been re uh, superintendents or are superintendents. And we have several current school board members who also serve on our team of consultants uh, as well. So they see it from uh, your side as well. And then uh, we are selected, and uh, Penny referred to this, as uh, selected by CSBA to be their representative search firm or their go-to firm. Um, our consultants have uh, extensive background in public service, uh, as I've already mentioned, current, form, uh, current and former superintendents. We also have a number of assistant uh, superintendents, uh, university professors, and school board members. Uh, we're rather proud that our consultants, firms, part consultants, particularly here in California, do represent the diversity of the state um, uh, uh, across the country, and so you'll see a variety of different faces uh, in front of you in terms of ethnic background, gender, etc. And 65% of us have doctorate degrees. Now, we do not hire the superintendent. Our role is we work for you and we recruit talent for you to consider. That's what we want to do, bring the best. Once we identify criteria, we look for folks who match that criteria, look for the pieces that you, you are hoping in your next uh, superintendent. Um, and we represent you and work strictly for you. Uh, we will have a point of uh, contact within your district, but uh, we, we are your employee once you uh, hire us as a consulting firm. We really pride ourselves on being transparent uh, through the process. One of the pieces, the last two searches I've been on, both in the uh, uh, post uh, session, uh, the board, and then our uh, stakeholder groups, both were very complimentary about how involved they felt in the process and how they really felt they had a word uh, in the process itself. Uh, uh, and so we uh, pride ourselves on being transparent. We involve stakeholders, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few moments. And we have a very solid uh, reputation of sustaining um, superintendents. There's mo nothing more disruptive to a system, system than to keep hiring new superintendents. Now, the other day I was traveling down the uh, road by my home trying to get to the freeway and it's just laden with stoplights. There are days I can smooth go through those stoplights and there are other days where it seems like I hit every one. And when you keep changing leaders, it's like hitting stoplights each and every time. And it, it, it does impact the system. <clears throat> okay. So, um, According to the National uh, Boards Association and Council of Greater School uh, City Schools, the average tenure for superintendents across the nation is 3.2 to 4.6. Um, part of that has to do with election cycles, et cetera. Um, but we at um, McPherson and Jacobson pride ourselves in the percentage of superintendents who we have that remain in their positions with the district um, for oh, five years or over. So if you'd go to the next slide. Uh, there, skip. there we go. 85% um, of the superintendents we've recruited have lasted over five years and currently sit in their position. Over 60% 
have lasted for 10 years and uh, 50 oh, nearly 50% for 15 um, and we feel that that's important and it's a result of the process um, which we'll talk to you about in a minute and which I've participated in myself as a seated superintendent um, and I can so I know personally the difference between um, uh, the McPherson way of conducting um, the recruitment process and others so uh, I'll point that out as we go you have at your table, you should have gotten a folder, and in that folder is a booklet that looks like this. This page is in there, and I'm not going to try to read it to you from here. I just wanted to give you a point of reference. Um, but this is essentially what's on that chart. Our process is five phases, and we start off, if in fact we're selected, we will be immediately contacting you to set up a meeting to determine what criteria do you want in the, your next superintendent or hope for it. Establish our timeline and also establish where do you want to advertise. As part of the contract, there are certain uh, locations already. Many boards choose to go beyond that. And as I mentioned earlier, by default, you're going to be on the McPherson Jacobson uh, website, which is a national website. The second phase is, is where we meet with stakeholders. Your, your, your community associates, and we get input from them. And uh, uh, yeah, we have a series of interviews. It says on the contract typically two days. I have yet to get that done in two days. Um, so it, it, it's typically much more than that. We'll work with you in developing the application and all the advertising material, and then we will certainly recruit and advertise. The third phase is we go through and evaluate reference checks. Now you know as a candidate, you're only going to put the people that you know will speak well of you on your application. We go beyond that. And because of our uh, widespread of uh, consultants, we have access to each other as well as on a national level. And oftentimes we'll get an applicant and we'll be looking at the, their resume and say, oh, that person was in such and such a district. I know somebody in that district. I'm going to reach out. So you're not just getting the feedback of those that they uh, refer on their application. We really go uh, very deep with all of this. And we do do the, uh, we home uh, the social network as well, and looking for things there. And that's where we have found more things uh, than in paperwork. Um, with you, we will develop um, uh, the interview questions. The fourth phase is, and this is a long meeting, it's typically about four to five hours, we sit down with you go through every applicant that was um, had applied, we had kind of sorted them based on those who fit the criteria you want and those who don't. And then, uh, but we share all that information with you. We uh, propose uh, five to 10 people you may want to give serious consideration. We also then have that group do a video interview <laughs> that you will be able to see before you decide who you want to interview. So you will, you will have met them virtually, so to speak, um, before any interviews. And then, in fact, um, we go through the interview process and we actually interview. If you choose to have a stakeholder group, what we will typically do is we try to do the interviews back to back, two days in a row. And while you're interviewing a candidate, um, uh, the stakeholders are interviewing another candidate. And again, and we would sit down and work this out, you may want what we call a social time with the candidate. And it's really an informal time for you just to sit and chat and get to know the candidate on a different level. It's one thing to interview and what have you, and as I often used to say, it's uh, the person who you uh, interviewed and hired isn't always the person who shows up to work. And what you want to make sure, and what we're trying to do is make sure you've got a pretty good handle on who this person is. Um, and then um, interview the candidates, stakeholder interviews, and then on that day, the end of that day, with you, uh, we'll have a long conversation about who do you want to hire from who we uh, have brought forward. We're not done there, though. You will go off and you will negotiate a contract. You will set, set a date to uh, formalize the contract. But we will come back and work with you and the new superintendent to establish some objectives um, for that, uh, the successful uh, launch, as well as uh, we have a guarantee that if the board composition doesn't change significantly in the first two years and something goes awry, 
we will come back and do the search again. The only cost to you would be the cost of our mileage or anything like that. But it's not a whole new contract that you would have to do. May I may I add something on this on this slide? So if you look at phase four under the stakeholder interview, I can tell you as a uh, candidate uh, myself at, uh, in the past, that is something that is unique to McPherson and Jacobson. Um, when I interviewed for one of um, my first superintendency, which I had already mentioned in Oxnard, um, uh, when I, the one of the first interviews was a stakeholder interview, and there were probably, and now I know this sounds daunting, but there were probably, I want to say about 15 people there. They represented all facets of the community. And why do I, why am I even bringing that up? Why is that important? Um, even though as a candidate that was daunting, I had the opportunity to meet all of the important, wonderful connections and stakeholders. Uh, in the community, they felt like they knew me, and it really gave me an absolute uh, wonderful foundation with which to start within the community. It, it included labor partners, it included the president of the local university, community college dean was there, uh, members of local advocacy groups um, were, were there. And they, it felt like I already knew them and they already knew me. Um, so, uh, and it also gives your community an opportunity to be part of the process if that's what you'd like. And so I just wanted you to know, having been through that process, that I really felt that it helped me have a great foundation in the beginning of my superintendency. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> and, and if I could just add on a little bit to that, uh, we, get, we do these stakeholder interviews and we put together a report of almost everything that has been said. The only time we redact anything is if it's real foul language or something like that. And we do it both face-to-face -face as well as online version. It's typically on the online version we get some things that are really ap appropriate for a superintendent search. Uh, but you will then, we will then present that report to you. Now what we have found, it then becomes a public document. And what we have found is the candidates comb through that document like you wouldn't believe because it really gives them some other insights beyond the criteria that you will establish. And so we find that is, uh, you know, when we see candidates, the, the edges are worn on their papers and things like that because they've been through it so many times. Um, and this is a listing of just a few of the associations, mostly here in California, that we are members of, either individually or collectively. And some of us are officers in these associations as well. Um, and this is also part of our resource when we're looking for a new superintendent. I can tell you in one search I did, it was a small school district, and we weren't getting applications. So I called the uh, director of the Small School Boards Association, between him and I, we ended, up, uh, we ended up having a candidate pool of 35 people in a very small school district. So, you know, we use these resources to your advantage. And it's so me, huh? Yes. This is based on uh, information our office received, uh, put together this timeline. Uh, and again, this is something that can be modified. This isn't written in gold, but this based on the information the office had. As you notice there, right away we'd be meeting with you in that first step to establish that criteria, set the dates, et cetera. Um, around the 14th, if we go with this timeline, we would post the position. We'd start the, uh, a few days later with the stakeholder meetings. And then during the week of August 7th, when we identified the specific date, we would have a second meeting with you. And this is where you, uh, we share the stakeholder input with you. Uh, we talk about the interview process, and I'll go over that in just a moment, and identify the interview questions you'd like to use. Then during the, um, uh, the week of September 7th, uh, we review the candidates and select the finalists you want to interview. Depending on, uh, and we're running into some religious holidays and things like that in September, I think the 8th and 9th, I think the 9th is Rosh Hashanah. Hosanna, um, and so and th that may be a conflict, but that, again, that's something we would work out if we finalize a timeline. So that by September 27th, if this is the timeline you want to use, um, uh, you would be appointing, and you have to appoint your new superintendent at a regularly scheduled board meeting. It cannot be a special meeting. 
And so we've got three uh, ways of, uh, that we look at uh, interviews. There's the traditional interview, whereas you as a board interview the finalists, and you may want to call back one or two uh, for more information. Another one is where you as a board interview, you have that social interaction. And that's really where we, a couple of you at a time, again, trying to honor the, the, the Brown Act, but a couple of you at a time meet with individual candidates and have an informal conversation uh, with who they may be. Um, and then um, also we, we get the input from the stakeholder panel. Now, the stakeholder panel, we do not allow them to rank order the candidates. When we, they interview the candidates, and after they do that, we then talk about what are the strengths that you got from this candidate, what are the questions you have about this candidate. We could bring that information back to you so that as you're doing your deliberation, you can see what your stakeholder groups uh, uh, working against. Um, some districts have chosen to have multiple stakeholder panels, um, and uh, it gets a little complex, but it's another way to add on to the process. Okay. So um, equity in our policy and practice is extremely important to us. Um, first of all, you have to um, ensure that every single search um, is that people are treated not only with respect, um, which is important to the district um, and also to us, um, but that we uphold all of the tenets of equity. E each person is treated with the utmost respect and dignity. Um, and a fair, fair and equitable treatment of all ac uh, applicants. Um, and though we do not represent technically the candidates, we ensure they are all fairly represented. And, uh, represented. and also, it's important that we're following all codes, ed codes, labor codes, and all of those things. And so, uh, that to us is really important. And I can I can confirm that that I always felt very well respected uh, with McPherson and Jacobson. The next is your investment. <laughs> okay, so let's talk dollars and cents. So to all five stages um, would be $24,000, not to exceed twenty nine eight, And within this amount is uh, four weeks of print advertising, 60 days um, forward at 40 word ad, 60 days of advertising in EdJoin. Uh, that's really, um, as I'm sure you all know, the big sort of where the big job board where everybody goes. The equivalent of two days of in-person stakeholder meetings, coming here and really interviewing various community members and anybody who would like to participate in that according to the board's desire. Online, online stakeholder inter input surveys, video interviews of the candidates, criminal financial and credential verification background for the finalist, travel expenses for consultants, um, to travel back and forth to the district and office expenses. Okay, that's that it. Thank you, and we're about there, and I don't know if that's our bill to, our hook to get off stage here, but the, the, the last couple here is, what we will also do is assist you in updating the job description if you want that, uh, effective, de helping you develop an effective contract, typically you're doing that with your legal counsel, and then uh, if the board chooses to make a, a visit to the uh, finalist uh, home district, uh, we would help you coordinate that. Our differences, we pride ourselves on being transparent. You, as well as your community, will know where we are, our sustainability of leadership, the involvement of stakeholders, and our commitment for a positive fiscal transition. So with that, if there are any questions. I think we're going to ask questions. Oh. No. Okay. Does anyone have questions? Are there any speakers to this item? Um, well, and, and that's the issue. We do have public speakers to this, so uh, the other. Yeah. Okay. How about questions from the board? 
Can we do that um, part now? Have them swap and give oh, okay. Okay. And then I think, thank you. I think that's more fair and balanced. That was, yeah, and I thought that was a very comprehensive um, presentation, so thank you. Thank you. So if you can give us just a, you know, time for the other presentation sure. and swap it. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm good? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for having Leadership Associates here to present. We're very, very excited to be a part of your search process. And we're going to go through our search and talk a little bit about uh, why we believe that we are the firm that will help uh, bring the t type of superintendent that you would like for your uh, district along the way. A few things I want to talk about, first of all, is looking at our tagline, Achieving Excellence by Nurturing a Love of Learning. I say that to you because having listened to the number of people here today from your community, we want to ensure that not only your students learning, we want to ensure your parents and guardians are learning, we want to make sure that your community members and partners are learning, and we want to make sure that you as a board are learning because we are continuous learners and we do believe in that. We will talk tonight about our process, what we do overall, and how we do it. We'll talk a little bit about uh, why we believe we are the firm for you, and we'll go from there. I'll start off by t saying that my name is Eric Andrew. I'm the retired superintendent of the Campbell Union School District. Was there seven and a half years. I've been with Leadership Associates for the last six years. During that period of time, I've completed about uh, 30 different searches successfully. In addition to that, uh, I've been a coach for superintendents and cabinet le level members. I also run what's called our Superintendent's Leadership Series and Superintendent Networks, in which we, I work with several superintendents throughout the, the state and talk about some of the issues that are going on today in education. And that's important for us because we, as a search firm, want to ensure that we are really understand what's going on in districts, both from the federal perspective, the state perspective, but also here at the uh, local level. And so this is how we stay on top of the game overall. So uh, both, uh, my partner and I have done that. We continue to do that. In fact, um, I just got a call while I was sitting in your parking lot. I got here a little early from a superintendent who wanted me to do a board workshop for them coming up in a couple of weeks and so on. I turned it down, just for the record. <laughs> 
a time crunch. Uh, with that being said, I would like for my partner to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about herself. I'm a little shorter than he is, but uh, I'm Blanca Cavazos, and I am the retired superintendent from the Taft Union High School District in the southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, I was uh, superintendent for eight and a half years, and uh, prior to that, I also worked at a uh, Kern County Superintendent of Schools, the County Office of Ed, and uh, also in a large high school district for uh, a little over 22 years. I've been a, a, a in pretty much every grade level, uh, or grade span, I should say, including uh, working with uh, adults in adult ed. Um, currently, I sit on the board of the Association of California School Administrators, AXA, and uh, I also sit on the uh, board of uh, Youth to Leaders, which is a, a group that provides scholarship and college preparation for uh, primarily migrant students. Uh, so with that... Thank you. And in addition, I'd like to, a little bit of my background. I'm a product of the Compton Union High School Union School District, so that's where I grew up. I've, uh, I'm proud of that. I think people should know. Although I've worked in Campbell, which is actually a bifurcated district, which has one high a high end as well as uh, students who are lower socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged in those cases. Well, I don't call it disadvantaged, but it's differently uh, resourced. And so that's what we do. One of the aspects that distinguishes us is that we also have it's uh, people that that are in working in the background to make the search successful, and that uh, work hand in hand not only with us um, but also with your executive assistant. Uh, each one of these ladies has been an executive assistant uh, to a superintendent, and so, so they know exactly what it is. Uh, that it takes to make this happen, and then um, they know how it should be posted, uh, how to put that on the website, uh, et cetera. And so they really are available to your executive assistant, to to you, to us, 24-7, uh, uh, and they are uh, assigned to to a search, and so generally we will be working with one of those uh, individuals that will facilitate the posting of the position, the application, everything which we handle. Another unique thing about Leadership Associates is that we are all, first of all, retired, and we're not doing it well, uh, superintendents, every single one of us. And so we stay in the game. We know the work of the superintendent. In addition to that, although Blanca and I will be your search uh, consultants if we are granted the search, we have meetings every other Tuesday with all of our partners that you see there up and down the state. And so we talk about each of the searches that we have within our firm. And one of the advantages you would have with leadership would be once we've had the community input where the board has had a chance to say, here are the characteristics we want to see in a superintendent, we've gone out to your community and they will have a couple of opportunities to say, here are the characteristics we want to see in the superintendent, we will then go back to our firm and say, here's what the Paro Valley School District said they want to see in their next superintendent. So we don't have a stable, we don't have people that we automatically think we're going to put into position because every search is different. Every search is different. And so the characteristics that you have here are the types of people that we're going to screen in order to put uh, as candidates forward with you along the way. These uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen here, they have membership in almost every state and national organization, everything from being executive directors. As Blanca says, she's, been, she's currently on the state board of AXA, which is the Association of California School Administrators. I've been on the state board. We belong to uh, CALSA, which is the California Association of Latino School Administrators. CASA, which is the California Association of African American School Administrators. We are part of AASA, which is the national organization. And although I'm going to talk a little bit later about our statewide reach, the reality of it is we also have a national presence. Uh, I don't know any searches that I've been on in which we might have people nationally from across the 
the U.S. and in some cases foreign countries who applied, or at least requested an application for us. So this is our, our uh, process, and, and one of the most important things is that the search begins and ends with you. Uh, we start with you asking you, what is it that you are looking for? And as Eric said, we don't start even thinking about anyone in, until we know what it is that you want and that you need for this community. And we... Uh, and then it comes back to you. You're the one that makes the decision as to who the candidate is that is the best fit. Uh, once we meet with you and you give us that direction of what it is that you're looking for, then uh, we move on to meeting with our your stakeholders. And you tell us who it is that you want us to meet. We don't know who the the stakeholders are in, in your community. As Eric said, every community is unique, and you have groups that, uh, and partnerships that others do not, and so we will uh, listen to you, and you tell us who it is that you want us to get input from, and we will ask them the same questions that we're asking you. What is it that you are looking for in the next superintendent? Um, we also have an online survey that, that um, people can fill out. And those are becoming, I think because of the COVID age when people went online and more people know how to navigate online, those are becoming more and more popular uh, and, and uh, with stakeholders filling those out, completing those because they can do that at any time. They can do that in the middle of the night. Um, but we also then uh, meet with those stakeholders and you tell us whether you want those to be in person, whether you want them to be via uh, Zoom, for example, or, um, or a hybrid. We've done those as well. Uh, and, and we get that information from you. Uh, we meet with your um, bargaining units. We meet with... Uh, uh, your your parents. Um, I am bilingual Spanish speaker, and so um, I am able and and often I'm the one that is meeting with those uh, the parents, your DLAC, ELAC, uh, or any other groups that you wish, um, and with your community leaders as well. When we uh, start that outreach, we are looking for those characteristics that you want. Um, and, and we do a broad advertisement. As soon as we are notified that we have a contract, we send out that notification to over 1,100 people that are on our distribution list. And, um, and that, that goes out immediately. We also advertise on uh, EdCal as well, and uh, as a member of AXA and sitting on the state board, I can tell you that any administrator who's an AXA member, the first thing that they read is that the job listings. Before they read anything in the front, they go to the back and look at those job listings. And so uh, we advertise there as well. Uh, we then, once we have the application, we do extensive vetting. Uh, the candidates are asked to complete uh, in the application. There's a little box that says, may we contact people outside of the references that you've given. Most candidates say yes. If they say no, there's a very, very specific reason why they've said no, and we share that with you. We are, we are very, very transparent with you. Um, that network that you saw on that map we are asking our partners, if we don't know someone, we ask them, do you know someone from XYZ district or that worked there, and what do you know about this candidate? Um, and so we don't necessarily just stick to those references that they've provided, but we also talk to other individuals to find out uh, about these candidates. So we do an extensive uh, reference and, and background checking as well. Um, and then uh, we present the candidates to you. We 
rank them uh, as far as whether they, in basically three categories. They meet all of the criteria that you have set, they meet most of the criteria that you have set, or they really are not there yet. And we share that with you. And then you tell us who it is that you want to interview. Uh, and you may want to interview someone that we don't necessarily put in that top tier. That is your prerogative and, and we will uh, follow that. We work with you to, uh, we set up the interviews, we make all the contacts with, we talk to every single candidate. Uh, and we share with you the information. We are, as I mentioned, we're very transparent in sharing with you what we have learned about the candidates. Uh, we at attend and are there. We facilitate the interviews uh, for you, and then we contact the candidates uh, as to whether they they are invited to a second round or not. Um, and so we make all of that uh, contact, and so then it comes back to you. Uh, and, and once you decide on who that finalist is, we also work with you on uh, possibly you know, going to make a visit to that person's district or office or wherever it is, if that's something that you wish to do. Um, so we work with you from beginning to end, and uh, at the end of the day, this is your search, and we don't ever forget that it is your search. One of the other things we ensure is that at least every two weeks, we're gonna send you some information. Information for you to use either as talking points to your community to update you. Here's what's happening with the search at this particular point. We'll say things such as, we've got 25 candidates who've requested applications. We have. 10 who submitted applications. Here are the number of people so far who's filled out the online survey. Here are some of the things that we're finding out about the online survey. So you'll be in, we'll be in constant communication if we're the, the firm that you select. So why us? As we mentioned before, we are all partners. We're not consultants. We all work for the same firm. The people you see in front of you will be the people who you'll see in front of us throughout the search if we're the, the firm that you uh, select. It is our job. We stay abreast of what's happening currently by working with current superintendents so we know what's happening in the field. Also, we talked a little bit about the administrative assistance, and that's important work because there are things that need to be posted on the website, so we'll be working with your administrative assistant as well as your tech people in order to make sure things are posted appropriately legally as well as timely for you. Uh, customizing, it's your search. We, we can't emphasize that enough. We have a very broad pool of candidates. We um, always bring forward uh, candidates of, of color, of, of various backgrounds, who meet the criteria that you said you wanted to see in the next superintendent. So our job is to make it difficult for you is to have several candidates that you have to uh, have some inward fighting about to say, no, I like this candidate because they meet the criteria. So that's our, that's our role. And we, we feel like we've done a good job when we've done that. In addition to that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the number of searches that we've done as a firm. And you notice that it says that uh, superintendent's place remaining in the district after three years. We used to be able to say five years up until about two years ago. And things have shifted, the climate has changed. I know you've seen in the newspapers different situations that are occurring out there. So right now it's probably about four and a half, but, but we put three because that's, that, that is a safe number. And, and so we wanna be open and honest with you about, no, it's shifted, it has changed. Looking at uh, the finalist, 63%, Women, people of color, we've made a, a very direct uh, effort in order to look for women and look for people, uh, uh, people of color, and it does not exclude anyone else. We, we just want to ensure that we have a diverse pool and that we're looking very intently and intentionally at some of our folks. And then the other thing is there are no hidden fees. The price is the price. The cost that we uh, quote it to you includes if we have to come out an extra day you come out an extra day we don't charge you for that extra day if, if it requires us to do a little more paperwork 
we do that. We don't charge you for anything uh, related to the search other than uh, what we've listed in our contract along the way. So with that being said, we're here to answer any questions or comments or discussions that you may have. Great. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna hear from uh, our public comments and is there, is there a place that Yes. Yes. Okay. So do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. Um, I do have a um, clarifying um, speaker card. Martha Flores, are you in the room? Martha Flores, I just need to clarify what, because you don't have the number of what item you want to speak to. Is it 9.3? The budget, 9.3? Yes? Okay, I just needed to clarify. Yeah, that's right. Is it is it the district's overall general budget, which is action item 9.3, or is it the SELPA local plan budget and service plan 9.4? The first one? Okay, thank you. I just needed to clarify before we moved forward. That we're not having that right now, but I, I needed to clarify because which one you want to speak to. So we do have um, two speakers. Um, again, a reminder that all speakers are um, allotted two minutes to each item. The speaker cards do need to be in before the item is brought up. I will call names by three. Please come up um, by those three names in that order. Um, Bill Beecher and Sean Henry. Good evening. Um, there's a few major decisions we have to make in our lifetime. One of them is figuring out what you want to do Work-wise, another one is picking a spouse, and by the way, you also have to remember what the spouse's birth date is. But lastly, another important decision, which is one for you guys, that you have to pick a superintendent, and that's not a. Well, we're missing my presentation, but I'll go on. Um, you saw in the, in the first presentation. There's a turnover of about every three and a half years here in California of superintendents. Why? A lot of them are just administrators. And they turn over because, yeah, they can run the system, but they don't know how to improve it or add to it. So they just keep moving on. So many of the candidates you're going to see are of that type. You don't want to hire them because our future of this community and of our children is you want the best superintendent, the best educational system we've got. And with that in mind, we are also plagued with some potential issues. Uh, this is the wrong presentation. This is 9-1. So I'll carry on without the slides. Uh, So you, you don't want to hire an administrator. You want to get the best person available, and you've got to be willing to pay. And on the pay part, some of you may think, geez, we can save $100,000 on the superintendent's salary. Well, that amounts to a $100 raise for our teachers, which is insignificant, especially in line that they just got a 10% raise. So some of you are thinking, we'll save some money for our teachers. Don't go there. You're hurting our kids. We need the best system we could get. A little over seven years ago, we were at 12th percentile in performance. We're now at 50th percentile because we hired a great, great superintendent. You need another one. Don't be cheap. Pay for what you need. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a school psychologist here. And so um, I'm here to talk, and I very much appreciate a chance to get to listen to both of the presentations, hopefully the other uh, other group is here as well, because it's, kind of it's kind of a weird thing. Um, ultimately, with the limited amount of time, um, the first presenters, um, very polished, basically have the, have the, 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 red, fl the red check from every, every different group. And I had a few questions um, that I wanted to have the board follow up with them. Um, and hopefully you're going to do that as well. Um, the, the LA Leadership Group, um, I 
don't want to say it, but I was just was blown away. Um, the questions that I had um, that I'm not going to spend as much time with, they kind of answered. Um, and I think, um, I think one of the questions to ask McPherson is, do you have a stable? Do you, are you kind of a recruiting agency as a, as a um, superintendent that you have certain candidates that you kind of want to get because you, you know, you've, you've collected them? And so that's, I love to hear that. Um, and when you talked about the five-year thing, uh, one of the impressive things was, yes, one of the first things we need to acknowledge is that we want consistency and, and sometimes don't have a chance to say that, um, but um, Dr. Rodriguez brought a lot of great things to the district and did a lot of great things. And a lot of times when you're in the board here, you're here just to talk about like what do we need to improve upon. So I don't want to get that lost. So we definitely want to find somebody that's going to give us the consistency because McPherson's 3.2 to 4.6 average for um, school district superintendents um, is a very important one. But the knowledge of what was being said and the personability and I just trust that they know what they're doing. And I'm glad you're not voting on this today because you need to trust but verify, okay? But one of the things was when you basically said the five-year average thing, because everything can be done. Um, McPherson said they have 50% of the people for the last 15 years. You might be looking at certain candidates very young to say, I want somebody here for the next 15 to 20 years. And you Thank may you overlook sure. for ageism somebody that might be the right person for the that next five, minutes. six, seven Thank years. You. Thank you very much. All right. Um, do, does the board have any questions for? Um, I have a question. But you're not, but no, so let's see. So for leadership associates, does the board have any questions? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? It's more of a, it's not really a question, more of a comment. Um, I believe you were the search firm that we used the last time that we did a superintendent search and you did a great job. Um, you brought us Dr. Rodriguez when she was an assistant um, superintendent. Um, so I really like that um, you don't overlook people maybe in the assistant superintendent areas that if there's somebody who's a rising star that you do uh, recognize that and bring them forward. So thank you very much for bringing Dr. Rodriguez here. We really. But our kids really benefited from that. You did a great job. Thank you. And I know for for me, you know, um, you know, you talked about you know the diversity of your candidates, and I appreciated that statement. A previous super, a previous assistant superintendent once said that PVSD was the first district um, where they felt safe to be out as a member of the LGBT plus community, and how does your firm assist districts in ensuring that candidates from other historically you know, marginalized communities are welcomed and encouraged to apply? Sure. We are members of several different groups. And we have members who belong to the community. And so we look everywhere and we talk to everyone and, and encourage them to apply, again, based upon what you have here. And so there's not a, a group uh, from a white male to uh, uh, LGBTQIA that we don't look for if it says, here's the right person for this particular job. The other thing in closing, I, uh, for myself, I forgot to do this, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to do this, and that is, we're in it for the kids. And I should have started with that. And I appreciate the work that you guys have done in, for the kids overall. And I was reminded of that when I looked over there and saw them and thought, this is why we do it. This is why we do it for our students along the way. But back to your question, no, we, we, we have zero boundaries, zero boundaries in terms of who we identify as would be a, a, the perfect fit here. Any further questions? All right, thank you very much. Oh, oh. Sorry, I do. Um, I was just trying to be courteous. Um, uh, Eric, thank you. Um, um, and Blanca, um, a couple questions I do have because, um, it, and it might be it's in the backup, but can we just have a point of reference here? Because the other search firm did post their um, fee in the PowerPoint slide. Mm -hmm. um, what is the fee? You, you kind of alluded to it at the end, but it wasn't actually on the slide. Wow, you ask us to remember that. I think it's at 26.5? 26.5. 
26.5? I believe. Yes. And you're saying that's that, right? <laughs> yes, all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I'm, um, as pretty much I think at least six of my colleagues, this is going to be our first time going through this and only one has the experience of going through it once. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe just for a little bit of elaboration for how these search firms work because the way I think the image I'm getting in my mind based off the sound of both your presentation and the previous mm -hmm. presentation, which I know you weren't in here for, it's sort of sounding like the search firms, and, and maybe you could speak, obviously speak to this for your firm mm -hmm. specifically, maybe you could speak for it, how this really kind of works in today's time okay. as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I do think I'm grateful that our, 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 our board has selected to use a search firm versus doing this in-house. I do think that's a wise decision. Um, but it sounds sort of like the imagery I'm getting in my mind mm -hmm. is that it's sort of like a club, like an inclusive club, like it's our members, our people, that's who we bring forward. I, I, kind of like an association or, or a club, an organization of sort where you have members of superintendents, perhaps assistant superintendents, maybe some other community members, and those are the people that are being pushed and brought forward. No, I want to I want to make clear we put out an application and we put it out far and wide. And uh, that's how we get to know everyone. We call every single candidate and get to know them. And that's how we get an idea of, is this person gonna be a good fit or are they not? Do they have the experiences and, and the characteristics and the background, uh, the proven track record that you're looking for? Whatever it is that you're looking for, do they have that? There is, uh, I would say there's not a club because we don't even know who's going to apply. As Eric said, um, we get people from out of state and out of the country that apply. I'm finishing up a search right now where um, there's a person that, that has applied that is in Galveston, there's a person that's in Seattle, and there's a person that is in Hong Kong that has applied uh, for the search didn't know them before this and and so no it really is not a club we do know a lot of people because we also do executive leadership training mm -hmm. and so the assistant principals and superintendents that attend that we get to know them as well and they get to know us um, but as far as a club I think it's the furthest from that because we go by who applies and we advertise, really, we advertise on EdCal, which is where most superintendents, if they're not looking there, they're, they don't deserve to be looking, <laughs> period, I, I think. Uh, because that's where everyone, administrators are looking, if they're looking for a job in California. And to that point of where you just said, where they're looking to apply, so that's really an open access? Yes. Okay, sort yeah. of like Anybody Ed join, can apply. like Ed join. It is like EdJoin, but yes. superintendents use EdCal more than EdJoin. EdJoin Ed usually is for other administrative positions in, a, in addition to Teachers, classified yeah. and certificated, other certificated positions. But yes, we do advertise far and wide. We also take a look at people who may be in the nonprofit space as CEOs, who may have been in the educational field at some mm -hmm. point, but have just so decided to go a different direction. None of that matters until we find out what your community says they want to see in the next superintendent. But if that's the case, then we're open. I mean, we, we've had those types of people. My wife was a former superintendent who's now a CEO. And so I now know her kind of realm of people who are out there that have been in education before, have run an educational nonprofit. So depending on the leadership qualities that you as a board and your community says they want, then that will help us do our outreach as well. Because it's not only people coming into us. It's us going out to other people, too, who we look at and say, hey, you'd be a great candidate for this particular position uh, based upon what we've learned from the community. And what we say is apply. You know, apply. And because you're the ones that are going to make that selection. You know, a previous speaker said, this is one of the most important decisions. We believe it is the most important decision that you make as a board. 
Um, and, and we take that extremely seriously uh, because that person needs to be a good fit because we plan for them to be here for a long time, you know, just as, as your current superintendent. Um, and frankly, she has, has set a foundation that it's going to be a tr an attractive position for people to apply to because they're going to want to continue that, that, at that level of work. And so, um, you know, you've had that experience. And uh, even though most of you are new and have not done, or I shouldn't say new, but have not done a superintendent search before, um, we walk you through that process. And as Eric said, we are continuously giving all of you updates on where we are in the search. So that if somebody catches you at the local grocery store and asks you, so what's going on? You know because we've kept you up to date uh, all along, and then you can share that with, with your stakeholders where we are. And, and, and I'm gonna ask a question of Dr. Rodriguez, but to just sort of end point on this with y'all, um, you kind of listed three categories that you, you rank, yeah. meets all qualifications, because there could also be minimum qualifications, preferred qualifications, mm -hmm. then meet some, doesn't meet enough. Are you bringing forward all applicants to the board or are you streaming out some just saying no this doesn't make the cut or or for whatever two things we'll do ever reason one we will give you a portal before we do the candidate selection that portal has every single application in it but it also has it ranked where we say based on the information we've gathered here or who we believe are your top layer here's the next layer and here's the third layer and we will caution you, and whether you go with us or the other firm, and that is this. When we give you that information before we have the selection committee meeting, you're going to find people in there, ooh, I really like this person. I think this person's a top candidate. We will have done the research and the reference checks to be able to come to you and say, yes, on paper they look great, and the references look great. But what we do in our reference checks is we find who's a person that we know personally. Even if they've written a letter of recommendation for that person, we call them and say, okay, offline, now tell me what you think of that person. But that's what we do in order to try to get a sense of, no, this person's the right person for us, for you guys. The other thing I will say is, we chose this district as putting in a bid. Because for leadership associates, you get to pick. You do, you get to pick to say, hey, yeah, I want that one. Or, now nah, I pass. We literally decided, no, this is one we want. And, and so just know that's our commitment to you. We believe in our own integrity. We're not gonna bring you people who we believe are going to embarrass you because that embarrasses us. So, so we will work hard to, to gain your trust and let you verify our trust with us. Okay, thank you, Eric and Blanca. So, um, Dr. Rodriguez, I guess just like, wanted to bring a question back to you if you don't mind. Don't mean to put you in the hot seat. Um, you did it to yourself. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, as a person who has gone through this, right, twice with two different firms, I mean, is there anything you could speak to, to us, to the community, to us, your board? Sure, so I have done one of each. So, um, so with Leadership Associates, I, I was in Santa Ana, very happy was not applying um, and they reached out to me and said we think that you're a good fit do you want to apply and then I went through the process and I got it I was not looking in the in um, newspapers because I wasn't planning on it that's um, actually happened twice now um, so I, I would say they're very comparable. The thing that I would say that with McPherson, I just was there. I did appreciate the social time that they had me do with the board. It was a full day interview. So it was from eight in the morning to six at night. And it was, um, I had 22 people that were on the community panel. And all those people have since emailed me and said, you know, we're glad to have you as the superintendent. We look, we were really excited seeing you in the interview. So I would say I appreciated that and that was different than here. I think regardless, both groups are going to give you the best of the best candidates and then it will be up to you guys to really know. And I, I strongly think 
that they would change their format if you asked them to change their format too, right? So I think it's just whoever, really it's whoever you want to work with. If you want to work with these two or you want to work with the other two because these are the people that you're going to be working with. So I would say whoever you feel um, you connect with better. I'm thinking just before we start getting into general discussion, we need to give, um, bring back um, McPherson to okay. have their questions. So okay. I guess that would just be that tag question to what Dr. Rodriguez said. That, that can, can, can I just ask that elaborating question to what Dr. Rodriguez said? You could modify the format if we wanted to include something such as what she just spoke to about the, her leading difference between working with you all and working with McPherson? It's your search. Okay. It's your search. We've done it both ways. We've okay. done it where, in some cases, the board says we want to break bread and have a meal with our candidates. We've done it where we've had the community meeting, a community group is a part of the process. We've done it where it's been exclusively the board. Each one of those has their advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk to you about that if we're selected to be the, the group. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. And you'll go with Alicia and then we Um, I'm just going to interject here for a quick moment. Um, Gil Stein and Roz Shorenstein, are you still in the room? Did they leave? Okay, just wanted to clarify. I just want to make sure. The, the public comments were before the board started asking questions and after the two presentations and before the board started um, asking questions. Thank you. Hello. Hello, thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> for your patience and for waiting. <laughs> um, I know I had, you know, one question and that was uh, basically that, you know, I mentioned that a, a previous assistant superintendent um, had said that they were, uh, that, that PVSD was one of the first districts they had ever worked at where they felt safe to be out as a member of the LGBT plus community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just wanted to know how your firm you know, assist districts in ensuring that candidates from, you know, historically marginalized communities know that they're welcome to apply to our district. Uh, well, we, we, we do spend a lot of time and we want to make sure the candidates we bring forward all represent a whole variety of different groups, including LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus. Um, uh, folks from that, not always will they tell us that up front, which is fine. Uh, but we have no reason to 
deny somebody. And in a few searches I've done, we have had uh, candidates uh, before the board. That's where the respect and equity piece comes that's right. in, right? That's, that's right. Yeah. That's a huge part of just our entire ideology in McPherson and Jacobson. So, um, golly, yes. I mean, we, we welcome everybody. It's just, yeah. Which is part of the reason in our most recent, uh, our own uh, recruiting of our own consultants, we're really conscientious about making sure we've got a diversity amongst us. And am I remembering correctly from your proposal that you don't like poach from your own districts? Oh no! Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, we won't no. Do, we won't do that to a, a school board. And even if we haven't placed that superintendent, they've only been there a year or two. Mm -hmm. We no, because we truly believe. And it was. It goes back to my analogy of the driving down the road and you keep hitting stop signs, how it becomes disruptive. Yeah. Um, yeah, we won't do that. Okay. Um. Trustee Flores? On one of your slides, you on the slide where you mentioned, you know, the, the timeline, mm -hmm. and you had specific dates, and I think that's great, and I think, uh, you know, ideally we would love to have found our future superintendent by September, but what if we don't have any candidates in mind and it drags out a little longer? Does the contract price change? And no. It, it's, a, it, it, it's the uh, whole search. Yes. However long. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, one of the things when we sit down and do the timeline with you is that's one of the pieces we wrestle out. You know, how long uh, do you want? And if, what's interesting, it's usually the last two days that we get bombarded with applicants. Um, but we don't wait because it's like, I'm not going to hold my breath for that. So we're on the phone getting people there. If for whatever reason, and I can't believe this would be true of Pajaro Valley, um, uh, we have a, a low application uh, uh, group. We will, uh, and I have not had to do this, but we would talk to you about extending the timeline. And there is no change in the timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Duke. Thanks for the great presentation. You guys did a great job. I love the timeline. I'd like to get a candidate actually hired before October 1st would be great. <laughs> So and that just came from our office, got it from somewhere. Because I called them, I said, is this the timeline they want to follow? And they said, they talked to somebody. I don't know if it's. <laughs> What's that? Oh, did they? OK. <laughs> they didn't tell me who. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. Trustee Scott? Um, thank you for the materials. I'm just curious, who are McPherson and Jacobson? Where are you all based? And what's that? What about? We were in Minneapolis, actually. Uh, yes, Minneapolis. I think we're back in the Midwest there. Sadly, both McPherson and Jacobson have passed. Um, and so we're now a little more of an independent uh, contracting group uh, because the original founders are no longer with us. All right. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. <laughs> I knew, I knew there was a question. I did. I saw it. <laughs> Seriously, trying to articulate this. Um, you know, with regards to timeline, um, because I have heard different things, like with you know ideal times for this type of search. Can you speak to that? That typically these searches do start to gear up after the first of the year, January sometime into the spring, prime time, most people at this level of a position looking to move to a different district are typically looking, similar to our superintendent, to make that transition in the summer months, not in the midst of an academic year. Could you speak to that? That is, you want to speak? Nope. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> We're trying to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> that is typically true. You're, you're, the month of January seems to be the surge. Uh, when you see a lot of people who is, have considered and are ready to make a move. But at the same time, we've done searches almost any time of the year. The big issue about this time of year right now is much more with, for those stakeholder meetings because trying to reach out to your certificate and classify folks who are on Zimmer Break. And we would talk to you about, let's push it back so that we can get them involved as well. But we have not had uh, a real issue finding candidates at this different time. And there's a variety of reasons that um, candidates will move at different times. And sometimes it's the district itself. Uh, you know, Pajaro Valley opens up and they 
heard good things and you know again the footsteps that uh, Michelle's leaving you know they're gonna say I, I, I want to be a part of that I want to build on that so you'll have people out of interest of your district yeah uh, so I and one of my other colleagues we both work in in higher ed I work for the CSU system California State University system and we do not do this at this time of year whatsoever even if it's a dean of a college which is the highest ranking administrator of that given college um, because of that because we have so many of our stakeholders that are on break and legally and lawfully and by contract and so we would not even start having this conversation until September I mean and we return in August so I mean it's just I'm, I'm sorry. yeah and part, of, and part of what we would probably want to have a conversation with you is do you want, are you comfortable going with an interim for a little longer time mm -hmm. and doing the search in January? That's what, what you choose. And again, there's no change in the contract, this and that. Once we've got a contract, we're going. And quite frankly, if we were selected now, we would start some of the background stuff already um, so that in January, we just sail. And um, also speaking to just at that point, on the background search, you do the full vetting background search before there I mean we don't want to find out something horrific I mean at least all the legal right. stuff for sure right? right absolutely and the web searches the Google search the everything under the Sun because you just never know what exactly is out and you there. would present that to the board that they yes. this is absolutely. this that. okay and we do criminal investigations financial investigations I know we do those two. I'm too, too blank on what the other one we do. But we do comb social media. Uh, it's pretty, it's kind of intriguing to read it about people's pictures. It is at times. Did a you really read the post there? <laughs> but I can confirm that um, the vetting process is extremely thorough. They call, as uh, Daniel said earlier, they call people, having gone through this, <laughs> um, they call people that uh, from districts three, four, however long ago from the, you know when you were a teacher or when you were an assistant principal 15 years ago they'll call and say because they know people um, that's the one thing about a firm that has so many really great people who've been in the business for such a long time is they know people everywhere and so they call and you'll get a call from a friend that you haven't seen in maybe 10 years and they'll say oh we just got a call from so-and-so about you know so there is a very thorough vetting of not just the people that are on the reference but others and it says that I think on the application may we call people outside of this application and it's really important that's a really important part of, of vetting as well and, uh, we've had candidates ask us not to call their board members and things like that and if we get to a point where it looks like this is a promising candidate we will say we're now ready to talk to your board you told them they're out looking at this point uh, because we think it's important to get the current board's impression done impression of them also and it just was, some of you asked me about where we're located even though we're in the Midwest we are California uh, bound and here in California and we have four staff members who support us in uh, a lot of the paperwork and day -to -day work. thank you thank you for answering and I'm going to replay this part for my students where you talked about the social media and how you do look at that because I do tell them that all the time and they don't believe me so I'm going to rewind this and replay it for them Thank you. Absolutely. Don't they don't. <laughs> Any, anyone else? All right. Now, if I may ask one, is your timeline pretty much your next meeting? You're going to decide who or what? Or, uh, or time. I believe on the 12th, right? Our next meeting is on the 12th, and we're hoping to make a decision by then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think also it might be important too that if the board were decide to were to decide to delay because I've seen this situation many times and say you know let's do an interim for a couple months and or whatever till we can get to a to a time where we feel we might get a better pool although Pajaro does, Valley does have an amazing reputation so I think you're going to get a, a, a pretty solid pool but if you were to delay um, I do know that Nick Pearson and Jacobson we will help you find an interim as well as part of all of that and help vet an interim if you were to need an interim so I think you're in that process already to oh are you oh I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. all right thank you very much you're most thank welcome you. all right yeah.
Are there any other questions or comments from the board? In terms of, so, any discussion about providing direction for the July 12th meeting? I'd like to provide some direction. I think we need to choose a search firm by uh, July 12th and vote on it and let's go. I think what they said is really valid. I feel like, Michelle, we didn't, when, did, when was your recruitment? I feel like it was over the summer and into the fall. Um, yeah, so I didn't come until, um, in, well, I, I needed to stay longer in Santa Ana, so I actually did similar to what I'm doing now. I came here several days prior to officially being here, um, but I didn't officially start until the end of August, but I was here for the first days of school mm -hmm. and um, came. Um, but I came here in August. Yeah. So the direction is that we'll have a, the agenda setting committee will put a, an action item to choose between or, or do, we, because we, if we're going to vote on a contract, we need to, to yeah, so, so the direction is so actually, we we, yeah. You would, you, you can't, you can't do it at the same time. So because public has to be able to determine and speak to who you're choosing. Okay. So you would need, you have the ability I would suggest that you have the conversation and decide tonight so that then you can put it on the agenda mm -hmm. because you can't speak about it with each other now that we've done it in open session. You would have a, a Brown Act violation right. if you did that. So you could have that conversation on the 12th and bring it to the 26th if that's what you would like to do, but you, um, you can't um, discuss it in between now and the 12th. Um, because you'd be having a Brown Act violation yeah. if you discussed it outside of here now that you've all had engaged in it. So, okay, with that, I have a question then. Um, so the first, the McPherson proposal was how much? 24 with a max of 29.8. And yeah, they're about comparable, and then yeah. leadership was 26.5. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually okay with either firm. I think they're both great. They brought us, leadership brought us Michelle the first time and um, I, I felt like they were essentially equivalent. So it's up to you guys. I'll support whatever the board majority feels like they'd like to do. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, I agree. We need to make a decision, move forward. Maybe we can't agenda agendize this for the next meeting or the, uh, the the 12th so that we can make a decision on this and get the ball rolling I know for me um, yeah so so I'll, I'll, uh, so trustee Soto do you have did you have any preference between the two I think I want to stay neutral in that conversation, but I, they're both pretty uh, bilateral as far as their abilities and what they presented, and so I think uh, I'd feel better letting this brood a little bit until our next meeting. I, I was just going to say that, I mean, this was under report and discussion. Um, I was not looking, I mean, basically stating that is sort of like stating a vote. The vote would just then be a formality. I, me, Personally, I would really and professionally would rather have more time as an individual to sort of absorb the information received tonight, just sort of like we do anytime we had a report and discussion item on the budget. You know, at our last regular board meeting, we we're going to vote on it tonight. We did not vote on that in the same time. And essentially moving forward with saying this is the firm we're going to, it's like we're saying we're voting that way. It's just we're rubber stamping at the next meeting. I would really like time to absorb the information I heard tonight bring it back um, at the next board meeting for that, I guess that would be further discussion to move forward with what the recommendation will be for the next meeting at the um, July, sorry, what day is that? 26, thank you, for the July 26th, and that gives us all time just to really decompress 
the information received tonight, absorb it, have that conversation at the next board meeting, and then move forward with who we want. And we should hopefully have, hopefully we'll have an interim in place by then to help be part of that process as well. Trustees, uh, okay, trustees. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I agree with that as well. I, I really want to read this beautiful presentation and absorb it some more as well. And I have family and friends who are administrators around the state, and I'd like to check, consult with them as well. And I think it, I don't feel like I, I could go either way right now, but I don't really feel like I can make a super informed decision right now. So I think discussing it at on open session on the 12th is a good idea. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I agree because it, I came in as a report and discussion. You know, I heard some good points on both sides, um, but I want to be able to, you know, read more and I wanted to follow up on one of the other ones. I have somebody that I got some good points on, but I still want to see how the other one measures up. Okay. Thank you. Anything to add? Okay. So it sounds like the direction that I'm hearing from the board is that on the, the direction is to the agenda setting committee will add an action item to choose between the two firms on the July 12th meeting and bring the contract from that selection forward to the July 26th meeting. Okay. We will move on to um, item 6.2, our early literacy support block uh, grant annual update, and that will be presented by Casey Kloppenbach. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. It is my privilege tonight to, pro to provide our annual update on the early literacy support block grant. And so just um, for those of you who have joined us on the board and for the audience, our um, Early Literacy Support Block Grant actually is not for all schools. It's actually only for the 75 schools that have the highest percentage of students in grade three scoring at the lowest achievement standard level on our SBAC in language arts, right? So, and the whole goal of the grant is to make sure that we have sound literacy instruction that actually impacts student learning outcomes. So as we're moving on, our three schools that qualify for it, so this is a multi-year grant, this is year three, um, or year two, we had a planning year, and next year will be the final year. So it encompasses Amesti, Calabasas, and Radcliffe. And these sites have been working hard. So tonight I'm gonna just touch base on the four categories that the grant focuses on, the accomplishments, and some of our SMARTY goal results and revisions and next steps. So looking at our four buckets, right? It's that access to high quality literacy instruction from the classroom teacher, the support for literacy learning on the campus, pupil supports, and then family and community supports as well. And so this is a great success from all three sites. They have um, been able to have multiple family literacy nights due to their literacy coaches and their family um, engagement specialists on their sites. That we're, we're hitting over 200 family members on, at, on some of those occasions and events, which is huge. And so when we're looking at the beginning of the grant, all sites had, all of those three sites had to do a needs assessment and then come up with a plan um, with SMARTY goals. And they have three main SMARTY goals. And as you can see, the SMARTY goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, and equitable, right? Making sure that all students have that access um, to that literacy instruction and achievement. And so the first one is really making sure that we have a universal screener, right, in literacy and making sure that we are looking at that data so we can make informed decisions um, across the tiers. And so looking at that, one of the accomplishments has been that we have our Dibbles and Edel data three times a year. And we were able to hit that last year and then also have data review team meetings where teachers are looking collaboratively at that data with their coaches because each one of those sites has a coach. And then um, looking at the students that really need the most support and seeing if the intervention is working for those students through progress monitoring. 
And goal number two is really looking at distributed practice opportunities, making sure that our students have the opportunity to practice what they need the most support in, in literacy. So I always explain it in terms of athlete, athletics, like in soccer, right? We use the screener to see what our students need or our players need. So if they need more support in dribbling, we're going to make sure that we give them that support in dribbling with that feedback. And so um, our SMARTY goal number two, the implementation, we really looked at making sure that phonemic awareness was addressed through Hegarty this last year, which was huge. Um, I, have, I have teachers actually asking their administrators to make sure they bring me into their classroom when I'm visiting because they're so proud of the phonemic awareness work through Hegarty. We also have the differentiated professional learning by the site literacy coach. So all three of those sites have a site literacy coach. And then our continued work through SIPs and making sure that we're using that to provide those extra opportunities. And then goal number three is really about the instruction, the literacy instruction implementation. So we have our um, core program benchmark. It's making sure that we're actually utilizing it the way that it was intended to make sure that all of our students have access to um, complex text and the instruction that will help them be successful. All right. So part of those of those actions this year we had um, work around and um, we had somebody come out and work with them an expert in literacy working with all three sites in the implementation of um, benchmark with through demonstration lessons planning and lesson study process and you see a picture of um, Nicole Marsh our early literacy coordinator who was really leading those efforts with those site coaches and so now to our early literacy data, our Dibbles, which is our, our screener, um, our universal screener that all of our students um, from K3 are given. And so as you're looking at that, we see the students that need the most intensive support are in red. That's the percentages. And you can see on the left column, too, that we have kinder, first, second, and third. And we want to make sure that we are decreasing the red and we are increasing the green and the blue. That means that, they're, that they, those students really just need that core instruction and support at that level. And so we want to, um, so as looking, at, we're going to look at a MESD first. And I just want to um, bring your attention to the decrease in the intensive supports, right, that are needed um, from 65 to 40 percent at the end of the year. Um, highlighting some of the success in second grade too, we continue, their site continues to reduce the intensive needs in second grade, right? Um, by, and also increasing the core, right? By 10% by the end of the year. And then again, third grade decreasing that intent, those number of students that need the intensive support by at least 12%. Moving on to Calabasas, you're going to continue to see the decrease in intensive support needed in kindergarten. Look at that. Kindergarten decreased the number of students in need of intensive support by 60% and increased the, co the core by 45%. That's what we should be seeing if what we're doing is working, right? You're going to continue to see that in kindergarten. First grade also decreased the number of students in need of intensive support by 21% and core by 9%. Third grade also decreased the number of students in need of that intensive support by 19% and increased core by 20. And I'm a few circles behind. All right, so moving on to our third site is Radcliffe Elementary. And you will see s some differences. Each site is a little bit of um, different, different results. We do see that continued um, acceleration in kindergarten, right? You see that decrease again by 32% in, in intensive and then 19% in core that we're, that we're increasing. So that will help us as we're moving kids along. And then first grade decrease the number of students in need of intensive by 17 and increase core by the same. Right? So we're getting rid of those gaps. Hopefully we're doing that early on and we'll start seeing the second and third start moving them as well. So now we're moving on to our map. So this is just a snapshot too. We use map to measure growth, right? As students are getting better at their foundational skills reading, they should be able to apply it now to map and comprehension. And then there's a correlation between 
our map, right, results, and then how our students are performing on SBAC as well, the state assessment. So as we're looking at our assessments, we were looking at those diamonds. We, that shows that about, f when they hit that diamond, that means that about 50% of the students are making their um, grow their projected growth, right? And so what I did is I gave you a snapshot because we want to look at multiple years. So you can look at a MESTI there in second grade. Last year, the percentage of students that met their growth um, projection was 25%, and now this year they moved up to 37%, right, as we're moving the students forward. Third grade, from 21% uh, making, uh, meeting their growth um, projection to 34 and so you see that at each of those sites, or you see the lack of it in certain areas. So that's when their um, early literacy team, they look at their data, they make adjustments for the next year, and then those inform our next steps. So looking at next year, we um, obviously we learned a, quite a lot this year. So we know that Hegarty, uh, if you noticed in kindergarten and first grade, we had great growth. That's because we, we added that Hegarty piece and trained our teachers to be able to provide the additional phonemic awareness for all students because we knew that was an area of need. We will continue to do our lesson study cycles focused on integrated ELD and writing with the coaches supporting those efforts too on those sites. And then that continued work with fluency strategies and interventions for second and, and or techniques, not interventions, for second and third grade students as well. All right, so thank you for your time. Are there any questions for me? Thank you, Casey. Are there any public speakers to this item? We do, we have one. Um, Marilyn. Yeah, me too. Okay, so um, I taught uh, 20 years in this district, primary grades, and uh, course reading, and reading is for meaning and enjoyment, and my mother used to teach, and she would get children in her room who she referred to as being phonicked to death. Phonics really comes in when you're writing. This is a longer discussion. But what was interesting is I taught at a Mesty and Calabasas schools. And these are two schools, I noticed, who also have Cruzio broadband, which is 5G, which is a heck of a lot of radiation. And I have a quote from a pediatrician doctor, Dr. Helen Caldicott. Radio frequencies emitted from mobile telephone towers will have deleterious medical effects to people within the near vicinity according to a large body of scientific literature. Babies and children will be particularly sensitive to the mutagenic and carcinogenic effects of this radio frequency radiation. It is therefore criminal to place one of these aerials on or near a school. So you have Wi-Fi, you have the so-called broadband 5G antennas. This is a quote from Dr. Helen Caldicott, medical doctor, pediatrician, co-founder of Physicians for Social Responsibility, quoted in an article, Telecom Tower Tsunami, from the New Milford Times of Connecticut of March 2000. What should happen is that all the internet should be wired. The microwave radiation Thank emitting you, elephant in the room, Wi-Fi Thank you, that was needs two minutes. to be removed. Thank you very much. Children need to be protected. Thank you, that was two minutes. All right, do we have any other speakers to this item? All right. Do we have any discussion from the board? Questions or comments? Trustee Scott? Can you just describe how the block grant funding is, how that is, uh, is disseminated through the budget or into the school site specifically? 
Yeah, so it's, it's a grant, and so a certain amount was allocated to each one of the sites based on the population of students, the number of students that were enrolled during the last year when they're using the, the assessment data from. And the, the state has a formula for each one of those schools. I would have to look at, at that exact formula, but they're actually given a budget string, which is attached to their literacy action plan that is reviewed, and that we have to give every little update and revision based on what the team from that site gives. And you know how much money it is per site? Um, no, it's different. I know Radcliffe and Calabasas are about the same. It's, and then, um, a MESTI has less because they have le they had less students that at that time. But it's about a, the total grant is just over two and a half million dollars. It's I, I want to say it's probably between like two point six five or something. All right. Anything else? Do, do you, you mind going back to the slide for Calabasas? So that first um, point, kindergarten decreased the number of students in need of intensive support by 60%. That's unbelievable. It is. When I'm talking about the teachers that are pulling me in, it was actually at multiple sites for different reasons. But that, one of the, um, the kindergarten first grade teachers were pulling me in to see that work because they were so proud of it. They know it's working. So as we go up through the grades, is it normal to have smaller percentage improvement just because it's harder to reach the goals? Or can you talk a little bit about what yes, we're our, here? Yes, our goal actually is to decrease it right away for early intervention, right? So we don't have those, those big gaps later on. So if we reduce it, it should actually be less in first grade right the following year so we will be looking at the longitudinal data and as we're looking at the whole district right we have actually been um, increasing in kinder and first grade we've been doing that decrease across the district and increasing the core so for the new board members um, something that I've learned and I'd like you to speak to it is that if you if this early literacy piece is not if we don't do well with early literacy with our students it, it's almost impossible to catch them up later and That's, then you see huge numbers of school dropouts etc so can you talk a little bit about that Casey? exactly that's why we want to get them reading I know our LCAP is all about making sure our students are successful for college and career later on but it, we want them reading at grade level by third grade right and so when, once we hit fourth grade the students actually it takes so much extra effort on their part and instructionally to make those gains the rate of improvement it takes twice as much work to to do it so exactly we want to be able to eliminate the gaps give the students like that core we always call it core plus core plus more that's what we're trying to do in kinder and then we won't have those gaps later on we'll have less students and then how you were you were asking that question about second and third grade Yes, our goal now is to target that second and third grade so we can clean up those gaps even more there too. Prevention is much better than having to intervene later on when, they're, when they feel unsuccessful. And so just in like, just one, two, three, the, the, um, the bullet points for how we're doing this are Paso a Paso, right? The early literacy apps that we, we roll out into the community. It's phonemic awareness with Hegarty, is that it? Hegarty is one of that we're working right. on here with doing Sips. the phonemic awareness. SIPS. What else? And then our benchmark. So right. actually what you heard, we need uh, the phonics piece, right? That left side of reading, and then we need to build their comprehension at the same time and the background knowledge, and that's the other side of the literacy framework. And that's where a benchmark comes in, so we need to be doing it together. And the way we know that it's working is by using these systems that track p kids' progress. Mm -hmm. Multiple measures, right? Because we never want to just look at one piece. So when we're looking at early literacy, we're looking at their dibbles, we're looking at some of our diagnostic assessments to help them, we're looking at our SIPs placement and, and um, 
progress monitoring there. We're looking at map. We're looking at writing pieces, multiple measures all the and time. And so the data helps us formulate plans to help the kids that are struggling. Yep. The specific or help all plans. kids, probably. All, all students, so they have time for distributed practices. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Casey. And That's I great. would just like to congratulate all three schools for their hard work. They've really worked yes. hard. Thank you. All right, we will go on to uh, item 6.3, our local performance indicator reflection report. That will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, our assistant superintendent of secondary. Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This evening, I'm presenting the local indicator report. Thank you. The local indicators are measures that are used um, at the, are the LEA uh, level um, and that are placed in the, um, on the state uh, dashboard. Additionally, the local indicators are, you can find them in the LCAP. It's one of the things that we look at to determine um, where we have needs and um, decide on action steps. The state has uh, data for us, which includes uh, suspensions, attendance, et cetera. These are not reported um, by the state, and that's why they're called local indicators. The local indicators that we're going to be looking at is the basic conditions at school, implementation of state standards, parent engagement, school climate, and access to a broad course of study. All LEAs have the same exact local indicators, and as I stated, they will be placed on the California dashboard. Sylvester, can you help me out? Mm -mm. Okay, so for the ba basic conditions at school, uh, we look at teacher placements, the facilities, as well as whether students ha have access have access to our um, our curriculum. And so, in this past year, we had 2.5 percent uh, percent of teacher vacancy positions, um, appropriately assigned teachers, which means they had the appropriate credentials to be inside the classroom, um, especially with our English learners, was 100 percent. And then access to a state board approved, local board approved curriculum was 100% for all of our um, students. For our facilities, we had all of our facilities that were in fair or above um, conditions. We had no schools that were in the poor condition. From looking at last year as compared to this year, we had more schools that moved up from fair to good or good to exemplary. Last year, we did not have any schools in the exemplary category, and this year, we had five schools. So that is a great tribute to our facilities department. Implementation of state standards. There are five subsections that are looked at that are rated between a one and five. All of this information is, is in detail in the um, report that was attached, and this is just a summary. Um, the majority of the subsections, we had um, the full implementation, which is a four, which is not a five, is full implementation, as well as um, sustainable. And so we're not quite there yet. Our uh, science is one of the lower ones that are um, rated. Um, it's the next generation science standards. And the reason, if you recall throughout this past year, we've had a lot of new uh, textbook adoptions for our science curriculum. So next year that will be bumped up and um, including just the elementary, which has been a long time waiting. For parent engagement, this is definitely a strength of Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Our parent engagement office does an amazing job in making sure that our, our parents' voices are heard. Um, in looking at it and reviewing it, the, um, some of the areas that were mentioned that where we can strengthen um, for our growth opportunities is developing the capacity of staff to build trusting and respectful relationships with families and then also working with sites to determine the strengths that our families bring to the table and not always having the assumption of the strengths that are brought and then providing professional learning and support to teachers and principals to improve the school's capacity to partner with families. This is something that we are working on and that includes the family engagement plan where we're asking all school sites to develop a plan that helps to provide this interaction between um, parents and then the school site. 
For school climate, school climate, we look at the student perception of school safety and connectedness. This is something that you have seen before. This is through our Youth Truth Survey. And so listed there is the school safety, engagement, and belonging as um, our students view it. And there's different questions that are asked. If you see an asterisk, that means that our school, our students rated this category um, of percent positive, which means it's higher than the California average. So the majority of the areas there, we are higher than the California average. But still, in looking at it, in the um, reflection, we do have areas of growth. First, I wanted to highlight the strengths. The first thing is the, um, the amount of social emotional health that we have for our students. Uh, our students, it's a very high rating and percent positive where students feel that our schools have the necessary um, help that's needed and know where to find it. Our English language learner students had a higher percent positive than our non-English language learner students. As well, our students with IEPs had a higher percent positive rating than students um, without IEPs. And then our LGBTQ plus students was at par with non-LGBTQ plus students, which is um, phenomenal in the state of California. And this is not something that you see across the state. So opportunities for growth, um, relationships, uh, students connectedness with the adults on campus, as well as um, school safety with students. Access to a broad course of study looks at items such as CTE, looks at items such as science, looks at items such as um, the visual and performing arts, as well as whether our courses are A through G aligned um, and different opportunities for our students. And so all elementary students have access to a broad course of study that includes um, district adopted curriculum, as well as all students have access to visual and performing arts. Um, and physical education. All middle school students, ha or all middle schools have visual and performing arts offered on their campus. All high school core subjects are A through G approved. Um, there are 72 high school courses that are career technical education um, with 26 different pathways that we offer now. So that is great kudos to Julie Edwards. She's still here. Um, we've had increased number of advanced place courses um, that students can take on the high schools, as well as increased number of ethnic studies courses on our high school. And with that, that ends the local indicator report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any questions, comments from the board? All right, great presentation. Thank great. you very much. Thank you. All right. We will move on to item 6.4, uh, Virtual Academy Re Reorganization. The report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much. So there has, um, I know there's been some conversation regarding the Virtual Academy Reorganization. And so um, this will provide the board just with some um, additional updates on um, what is occurring um, with that. So I'm gonna be providing an overview of the Virtual Academy, the reasons behind the changes, um, what are those changes, what was the timing of that, and then also the transfers back, and then some of the options um, for homeschooling. So we did start, so as COVID-19 hit us, um, we had a subset of families that weren't ready to come back at the time. And so because of that, we work swiftly in order to create an additional school, which we called uh, the Virtual Academy. So we have been using um, ESSER funding in order to maintain that school open because it has not been self-sustaining. Um, and you can see that it's been on a steady um, decline, specifically at the elementary level. So um, we started out with 223 students, 94 of which were elementary. Then it went to 47. And let me explain the three numbers after for 22-23. So in December, when we were making the decision, we were at 41 students. By February 15th, which was the day in which we released the information to the parents, we were already down to 37 students. And then by May 31st, there were 33 students um, within that school. Um, and so definitely the reduction to the February 15th was not due to any information because that's when we disclosed it was on February 15th. 
Um, we did tell them, tell the parents at that time that the K-5 students were going to be going back to their home school, or if they selected to, they could go to PCCS, and um, that we would be maintaining um, grades 6 to 11 to remain um, for the upcoming school year, and their physical location would change to Renaissance High School. Um, and the 7th through 12th grade students would be overseen by Renaissance High School principal. Um, and something that was important to the seniors, that the seniors would continue to graduate from virtual academy and not, not from necessarily um, Renaissance. So all the current activities and staffing continued throughout the school year. All the changes are slated to happen this upcoming school year. Um, so to facilitate the process, Student Services Department did automatically assign those students to their neighborhood school. Um, we asked the families after March 13th to go to their neighborhood school to fill out any necessary forms. Um, we also made a concession for them and we reopened the window so that they could go to a different school other than their home school if they so chose because at that time the window was already closed. Um, and that we would allow them um, to have priority placement um, as a concession. So we did give them the option of going to Pacific Coast Charter School, which is actually here in this facility. And generally there's about 30 spaces available. Um, and we provided them the information on how often um, they actually have educational activities happen and how the middle schools have workshop classes opportunities as well. So I wanted to note that the numbers actually um, didn't shift too much for us. So out of the 33 students, 27 of those elementary students are going back home. Um, four of those elementary students went to PCCS, and we did have two confirmed elementary students go out of the district. Um, and you can also see that for the following grades 7 through 12th, it remained fairly consistent. It did go down as well. So for those students, it went from 125 students to 110. However, you will notice that they lost the sixth grade. And then we had 11 students that went back to their home school. Um, and so because of that, we didn't necessarily lose any students going out of the district. Um, but we did um, have some that went back to their, their home school. And um, that is um, the presentation and just some information and update on um, Virtual Academy. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one, Marilyn. How does this... Can, I'd like to read something on here. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I'd like to read something here about COVID-19. By the way, they've never isolated this virus ever. All the countries who've been asked show us evidence of the isolation of this virus, not. Dr. Thomas Callan wrote a book called The Contagion Myth, I recommend. But people are getting sick. What are they getting sick from? Well, we have pesticide poisoning here in Pajaro Valley, radiation, malnutrition, etc. And this was a, like a great takeover of the schools, I think, and great sales for um, the telecom industry, right? All these toxic Wi-Fi radiation emitting computers, the laptops given to people, the kids. Um, oh, I have a few copies of this, so stand together for our freedoms. Marilyn, is this specific to Virtual Academy? Yes, it's talking about COVID-19, which is why you had this. Our freedoms are under threat if we do not act now. Fourth of July is coming up, right? There are nefarious global agendas behind the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic mandates and policies. These damaging actions were designed to financially benefit a certain small number of billionaires and corporations and to gain control over populations. 
COVID-19 was long pre-planned in the documents and simulation exercises emanating from Bill Gates and BlackRock giant foundations and governments. This gives some good reading materials as you are educators and you study different sources of information to find out all you can about the truth. Thank you. I'm sure some of you who would like this. I'm, Thank I you. That was two minutes. You you're going to throw it out. All right. Any other questions? Comments from the board? All right. Thank you for the presentation. All right. Then we will move on to item 7.1, our uh, visitor non-agenda items for public comments. This is an opportunity for the members of the public to address issues that aren't on our agenda for the evening. Um, and just know that although we can't engage in discussion, we are listening. So do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have three, and I'll call you up in that order. Sean, Marilyn, and Christina. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, there's a lot of things that I want to say, so um, I kind of have to separate. And I have two more cards in, and I'll, I don't know if I'll make it through uh, to the to the two other item uh, other items. Um, so I wanted to speak about a couple things with the other questions, um, but maybe I can't do that. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. One of the questions I wanted you all to ask, and I'm pretty sure both of them will do it. Um, but I think it's really, and, and I want to commend actually um, the board because you did the right thing. Um, the biggest thing for these two groups is to vet them and to make sure that that you make sure that you do the background on them to make sure the choices that they made. And the first thing I would say would be, obviously, that was a good thing that they that that uh, the LA leadership group brought us, um, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, but. Um, the question I'd want to know is, were either, uh, either of them the ones that actually were the search agents for the one that they just hired at Stockton who she's taken over? Because those background checks and making sure you get it right is really important because the person that Dr. Rodriguez is following has really screwed it up in one year, basically embezzled and a whole bunch of different things. And that person was right here in this area at Alisal, and they tried to pass him off at Salinas City Elementary School District, and we said, no way. So there was plenty of information or data. So one of the things is every good golfer can have a mulligan, but if either of those two have the mulligan and why Dr. Rodriguez is leaving is they were the ones, because if either of them won, I would basically say that would be the one you need to go with the other one. And I only have 15 seconds to go. I am looking great. I'm sexy. Unfortunately, um, I am sick. And I have been diagnosed with stage four uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. And so I want to speak about health care. And I want to speak about the budget. And I'm going to go. Thank you for not cutting me off for a second. I'm going to basically go. And, uh, and I may be back, but this will probably be the last time I'm speaking. So I'm hoping to be back to talk about a couple more important things. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry to hear about your health. By the way, statistically, it's a very high rate of cancer developing after the COVID shots, very high, and a galloping rate of cancer. You can see even on the VAERS report. So, you know, I feel like I'm a health advocate and trying to sound the alarm. There's a problem here with the radiation. 
when you know there's a problem, if we had common sense and we weren't inundated by corporate propaganda, the common sense response would be, I didn't know that was a problem. Thank you for telling me that. What can I read about it? I don't want my children to be in harm's way, but I don't hear that from people. And the evidence is huge. Bioinitiative.org is one source. Cellphonetaskforce.org is another. And WestonAprice.org is another. Here's just something brief from their publication, Wise Traditions, from spring of this year. It's called the Graphene Age. Graphene oxide is a compound of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in variable ratios, which can be formed into ultra-thin layers about one nanometer thick. Graphene's high conductivity and flexibility they make it the linchpin of 5G wireless technology, which is the broadband, as it is a super absorber of microwaves. Graphene oxide transistors are in every 5G transmission device. Uh, Wi-Fi microwave frequency bands range from 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. Frequencies in the 5G range operate at more potent power densities than those in 4G. Thank you, Marilyn. That was two minutes. Okay. It tells the uh, adverse effects. Thank you. And links to why young men are dying of myocarditis. Thank you. On the athletic fields after the shot. Thank you. That was two minutes. Good evening. Um, so I am Cece Kalinda. I teach at the RISE program at Amesti Elementary. RISE, in case you don't know, is our therapeutic program for students with emotional dysregulation. And I just wanted to speak with you guys tonight because I have concerns about next year and then also to re-invite everyone to come and visit our program. Um, so, my concerns, next year I will be teaching grades first through fifth in my classroom. That's first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, all in one classroom. What this means for our classroom is that we're going to be running three different schedules so that students can go to lunch and recess with their grade level peers and I will also be teaching five different grade levels of curriculum so I'm a really really good teacher you guys but I'm not that good of a teacher and I'm worried that I'm gonna need to drastically reduce the amount of academic material that I give students and that's a disservice to them um, not only is that a disservice to them academically but I'm worried about the developmental levels in my classroom I mean the social, the emotional, the physical, like the PE standards from first to fifth grade, it's gonna be impossible for me to hit all of them and that's not good for my students. Um, I'm also worried about myself, like how I can keep up with the workload, how I can lesson plan and then how I can implement those lessons in a way that's meaningful to my students and I'm worried about my staff because the reality is that we already have a challenging population and we love the work that we do but we're gonna be juggling intense behaviors and three schedules and I, I'm just, I'm worried about burnout and I want us to continue to love what we do and to really serve our students in the best way possible. Um, switching, I would like to once again invite you guys to come visit my program. Um, I just talked to you about some of the struggles that we're going to be facing, but we have so many successes. And um, if memory serves me right, Dr. Rodriguez visited us three times at least last year, but I don't think I saw anybody else in our classroom. And while we are housed at Amesti, we are the elementary program that serves students with emotional dysregulation. So I guarantee that mm, probably at least four of you have students from in your area in my classroom. And I would love for you to come 
and show their support and get to know them and get to know what we do. Thank you so much. Is that it for public? All right. So we'll move on to our employee organizations. And so um, each will have five minutes. And we'll start with PVFT. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> As a union, we believe that strong educational leadership must be grounded in a comprehensive understanding of the challenges and realities faced by teachers and students in the classroom. It is through this lens that effective policies and decisions are made, ensuring the best possible outcome for our educational community. So choosing to put a person in a position for any length of time, regardless of how you phrase the, the temporary position, um, who does not fully grasp the needs and concerns of our educators and students is sending a message. And that message is that the district's values of the role of our educators and the importance of classroom ex expertise doesn't matter. So we ask that while you um, are looking for somebody to be acting or interim, uh, be a person who um, can, you know, that you make a decision that reflects the shared value that we have for our students and our school's employees. So that's, I just wanted to start with that. And I then want to, um, I wasn't here, I was, in, I was out of the country the last uh, meeting and I know that my colleague was here to represent us, um, but I wanted to personally say thank you Dr. Rodriguez for your years of service in our district. Um, we wish you well in Stockton. Um, and what I am grateful for, um, I don't know if you all know that, but Dr. Rodriguez and I ha come from the same um, program. Uh, so we had the same professors. Um, and we value bilingual education. And so one of the things that Dr. Rodriguez did in our district was um, establish or like really re, um, build on our bilingual program. And that's what we're hoping that whomever steps into this position, they continue with that. But what she also um, made very clear in the um, connection that she had with our community is that in this district, it is really important that our, that our superintendent be bilingual. Um, that really brought families to our sites. Um, she was present, and you just had a teacher testify to that, that she was present at sites. She did go to um, classrooms. She went into mine when I was in the classroom. Um, so, you know, these are some of the uh, elements, um, the qualities that we would want in, um, in, in a superintendent who is coming in. And so the most foundational aspect of that is that they themselves have been an educator in the classroom or an educator who worked directly with students and the families. It dilutes the importance of this um, of this position when the person who is um, installed in there, regardless of the amount of time, does not have that foundational um, aspect. So um, thank you for your years of service. We wish you good luck in um, Stockton. Um, and I am not going, I, I need to leave early tonight because I'm jet lagged. Um, but I do want to, I, I spoke at the um, May uh, board meeting um, regarding the visual arts, I think it was May, sometime in May. <laughs> um, and what has been presented to us in regards to having teachers split sites uh, this is really difficult and for an art teacher, for any kind of, any, any teacher in the classroom who is working with a community of students, it's very difficult to be split amongst various sites. Um, 
but the the challenge of or the disservice to our learning community to take away visual arts and eventually phase it out in elementary is is wrong. Um, <clears throat> I already shared with you as a ling as an English language learner, the arts um, was very helpful in helping me build language and also to write it. And as an educator, a bilingual educator, um, I used the arts in teaching English. Um, so let's be creative. If we are a district that speaks to being innovative, let's be innovative in how we make sure that all of, all of our elementary um, students receive arts education, visual arts educa education. Um, but also remember that visual arts education really does help with art, uh, with literacy. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSEA? Oh, sorry, do we have any public speakers to decide? Yes, we do, we have one, Mr. Beecher. No, that's nine. Oh wait, 9.1, yeah, sorry. But thank you for the knowledge. All right, do we have anyone from CSEA? All right, anyone from Pavam? All right. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Brian Saxton, the Director of HR, and it's my pleasure to present these remarks on behalf of PAVAM. This summer, administrators working in conjunction with Expanded Learning, shout out to JLB, uh, and her Expanded Learning team have been continuing their efforts to ensure that our students are afforded the best education on the Central Coast. Currently, we are running summer school at a number of our elementary and secondary sites. PVAM, PVAM members are vital to the success of summer school, ensuring students arrive, get fed, have a clean and functioning campus, and continue to learn. This past school year, administrators and managers rose to the challenge of another year filled with adventure. We started off the year still dealing with COVID and then had a record-setting winter, complete with flooding, school shutdowns, and one school site having to be moved entirely to a different location. Through it all, PAVAM members stood tall and continued to encourage each other and ensure that their students and staff were safe and taken care of. As we move through the summer and catch our breath, we cannot help but think of next year. PAVAM members are busy, busy hiring staff, planning relevant and important professional development for new staff as well as our continuing staff, working to make sure sites, buses, technology, and everything else is ready to go for the upcoming year, and as always, all of us are focused on ensuring staff and students have what they need to succeed. It will be a different start to the new school year as for the first time in seven years, Dr. Rodriguez will not be there to set the tone during leadership advance. Not the leadership retreat, it is the leadership advance. Right? We will miss her leadership and wish her the best in her new district. But rest assured, she has empowered us and created a team of leaders who will carry on what she has started and who will continue to do the vital and important work that needs to be done. Her leadership has been impactful while she was here and will continue to be impactful long after she is gone. Pavan, thanks you, Dr. Rodriguez, for encouraging us to be the best that we can be. Lastly, I would like to say that as I enter the last half of my third year of Director of HR, I cannot help but think what amazing people I get to work with. I'm in contact with all of our administrators and managers, and it is a talented group of individuals. Being able to work with all of them is such a great benefit of my position. To be able to see the work that they all put in to ensure that their schools and departments run smoothly and that students, family, and community members and staff feel welcome is a sight to behold. I know that Dr. Rodriguez is leaving, but if our next superintendent happens to be watching, just know that she has left you a team of amazing people who are ready to take on any task and do the hard work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Any public speakers? All right. Do we have anybody from CWA? Not today. All right. Um, so we'll move on to our action items. And I'm noting that it is 948, and we still have all our action items, and we need to go back into uh, closed session to finish that up. Um, can I get a motion to extend our meeting? 
make a motion to extend till midnight, um, but I think we can get through these very quickly. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries 7-0. All right, um, item 9.1, uh, appointment of acting superintendent. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, thank you very much. Although I always try to be very present um, over these last seven years and specifically these last four years um, when I am not here, um, second in command has been Clint Rucker specifically the last two years. And so I'd encourage the board to appoint him as acting superintendent until the interim superintendent is selected. As is noted, a school district must have a superintendent and my last day my last physical day will be today. Um, however, my last um, technical day is Friday. So of course, if something was to happen, I would come back. Um, however, um, today is my last physical day and Friday is the last day of my contract. So I request that you place Clint Rucker as our acting superintendent. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do now, Mr. Reacher. I need the clicker though. Who ran off with the clicker? Oh, it's on the back side. Um, I'd like to kind of put it in a different context. Um, I appreciate the suggestion. I've worked with Clint, great guy. Uh, but I think the district needs continuity and why uh, COVID-19 and our teacher shortages have put our school system under tremendous stress and this coming year is not going to be any better it'll be worse because we'll lose more teachers which will create even more turmoil and you heard it all year from PVFT and the other groups and Dr. Rodriguez is leaving so that leadership is going to be gone so until a replacement is found, we need stable continuity for our students. A temporary outsider will not provide that. And so I think having Clint as a potential solves that issue. Don't go outside because whoever comes in will be an administrator and they just won't be able to handle the issues. However, uh, we had complexity that's been put into our system using Google Classroom and other methods that got us through COVID-19 and our teacher shortages this last year, it gets worse next year. And so <clears throat> what I would suggest that we do is you pick somebody internally who understands and has had their hands on that system uh, over time. And so my recommendation is I would have Lisa be the interim because she ran the programs. She knows how they work. She worked with Dr. Rodriguez. Our students need to have that kind of continuity. Now, there might be a hybrid approach, but we gotta recognize the job that she's done over the last couple of years. So my, my recommendation is I would have Lisa be your interim. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Any questions or comments from the board? It's an action item. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve Clint um, Rucker. I didn't want to say it wrong. Clint Rucker as our acting superintendent. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Well, shouldn't we ask Clint if he opposes? <laughs> <laughs> Does he want to make any comments? I appreciate that, Trustee Acosta. Um, <laughs> all I would say is I, I love this district. This is my home, and I'm happy to help out until we can find an excellent superintendent. So thank you all. Thanks. All right, moving on to item 9.2, approval of the 2023 Local Control Accountability Plan. The report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. I don't need that. 
Good evening again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and for the last time, final Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so this evening I'm asking for the approval of the um, LCAP. It was presented at a public hearing on June 14th, two weeks ago. Um, it, the revisions of, to this LCAP, so this is the third year of a three year where we completely rewrite it next year. But the revisions were um, at the helm of over 1,200 stakeholders who had input into the revisions. And with that, I ask for the approval of the LCAP for the 23-24 school year. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? I'll All make a motion to approve. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.3, the 20, the 2022-23 budget. That's what I have written down. So 2023-24 budget and the actuals. Um, so a report will be presented by Clint Rucker. Thank you, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Yeah, so as you are all here um, last board meeting and we presented in our public hearing the budget um, we are now coming back with that budget um, with no changes to what was presented to the board and shown to the public um, do want to just take the couple minutes to thank both Colleen Bugion and Jenny M for coming and joining myself and the board um, on Saturday I actually really enjoyed it it's weird my wife asked me when I got home she's like how was it was it okay I'm like I, I got to talk about budget for a few hours like of course it was fun but um, so again thank you for the opportunity I, I do you think um, in the spirit of education, educating on the budget is very important? And um, I know it's something that Jenny, myself, and Colleen have talked about doing in the future and how we can better create fiscal transparency. So thank you all. And with that, I just ask that you approve our budget for the 23-24 fiscal year, as well as our estimated actuals from the prior year. Any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have two, Sean and Martha. All right, it says seat six, tweet. Okay, all right, perfect. So, so all right, um, so uh, about the budget. Um, before I go to that, uh, I wanted to speak to a couple items, and so I kind of threw something out there, not knowing if I'd be able to say it, so it wasn't to come to say, hey, I have cancer. <laughs> Um, so, and uh, we just have so many dedicated professionals that I even got an email from somebody who's retired and, and I won't say their name, but I appreciate what they said. Um, so the reason why I wanted to talk about the budget and, and related to that was, um, Dr. Rodriguez, you've done a lot of really good things here, but I'll always remember what I think was one of your first mistakes. And that was trying to put a cap on our uh, medical benefits. And, and we were told that we could not afford them. And so I want to point out with this budget, seven years later, we don't have caps on our budget, caps on our, our medical. We get to go to somewhere like PAMF or Stanford uh, to get the care that we need, whether we are a custodian, a teacher, a cabinet member, a psychologist. And we get to get, get to have some more choices in the decisions that we make. And so one of the decisions I may, may be making is whether it's worth to do chemo or not. But that should be my decision. Because someone could basically take a look at that in a, in, a, in a graph, in a spreadsheet, and say it's not worth it. He's going to die. Because that's what they basically tell you. I have six to eight months, and I might live a year or more if I got the typical uh, um, pancreatic cancer. So what I want to say is I'm proud of this district. I'm proud of my union for fighting to have quality health care. It's not that we're the, and we're one of the few ones that still have it. And I know that we don't get the pay that we have because we're paying so much for that. Um, but I, as a person who would never go to the doctor until I was in my late 30s or 40s, my wife would tell me, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. My pay, my retirement, my plans, they don't mean anything if I don't have my health. And we should be proud of the health care that we have and we should be a model to get it back for everyone not be the last bastions of holding on to quality health care thank you
Thank you. I was at the last meeting for the budget, and when I went home, I wanted to, I reflected, and I wanted to see the end product. I want to call you to the celebration of our students. I want to give you the, an example of our bilingual newcomer, Jasmine Garbillo, former EA Hall middle school student, Watsonville High School student, went all the way to law school and graduated this May. That's the product that I want to see through our budget. Stakeholders, her parents, and um, obviously her, the parents were great in, 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 were uh, are a great example of parent involvement. ELAC, school site, and that's where we need the transparency and access to the budget. They were involved in many uh, services at our schools. And she's an example of our student achievement. Thank you for that scaffolding and chunking of the budget. I was impressed. Now, again, I want to add to that. But what are the services for our staff? We need a space for staff wellness. Please know, we, as, as it has been said, we went through COVID and the floods. We are in urgent need for the following. Teacher and staff deserve to have a positive workplace where our well-being is honored, not judged. A comf uh, confidential and non-judgmental -ju place. A place to refocus, reset, a calm place a place to vent, breathe. We need 100% support, support for our well-being, nuestro bienestar. In return, we can be at 100% for our students and our parents in our community. Please, disclaimer, this wellness support should not be interpreted with our employer rights. And I bring this to attention having gone through some situations where I needed a place to go, where uh, because there was limits that I could not use the health office at our site. Thank you. And Dr. Rodriguez, I'm sorry if I really bugged the heck out of you during the COVID <laughs> pandemic when I would call you in regards to parents and our students who couldn't have access to uh, the virtual learning. But I thank you for always having an answer. It, not even, uh, really quickly, less than 12 hours. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your service to this community. Y necesitamos a alguien que hable español as our next superintendent. We need Thank a bilingual you. person or a multilingual. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Is that it? Okay. Any discussion from the board? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. I have a question for Clinton. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed in the budget, on the salaries, class, classified certificate, I understand we have, we combine administration because we have certificate in management and classified management, and you put them in to those two. What is the, if you excluded, if we just took the administration management, excluding CSEA and PVFT members, what is an approximate ballpark figure, annual cost of administration to our district? Annual costs, I would have to look for annual costs. It is broken out in the, in the budget. Um, so if you look at the object codes, while 1,000s and 2,000s do roll up when we look at certificated and classified salaries, you'll notice that in those uh, categories, 1,300 is actually split out to certificated administration, and 2,300 is classified administration. So they are actually split out into the budget, just not in the overall mm -hmm. classified and certificated salaries when we look at that piece. But um, yeah, Dr. Rodriguez can show you where it's split out. In the past, you've done um, pie charts mm -hmm. that actually sh can, will show the percentage of the budget and with a dollar amount, that mm -hmm. would be, I think, helpful maybe in a B2B Absolutely. moving forward. Yeah, and it's about, it's okay, still just right. around just under 6%, so that's still around the percentage, but dollar amount, unfortunately, trying to do 6% with just salaries in my head is, um, and benefits. Benefits is a little harder to break out because unfortunately they don't code out separately. But we can definitely do a B2B on that. That would be possible. So it is in our state of the district. So 2% um, um, district um, certificated management is 2%, so about 5.2 if, if we're doing that. And then it, classified management is another 2% of the budget. It would be great in the future. Be, I'd love the exact figure, but thank you. For, that was helpful. Thank you. Of course. I'll second the motion. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I have more questions. No worries. 
Um, again, I want to thank you for um, and your team for putting that together and also your openness to considering to do that again in the future. I think that it is something good to do at, at a minimum every other year and right and that kind of times with election cycles and potential new board members and I think the timing of that is is excellent and it was great transparency um, and, and I'm sorry that there was some audio connection issues I the one thing I would say and I even went back to watch it on rewind because it was very hard for me to hear and then at the point I couldn't be heard um, it, and it was still hard on our YouTube channel to hear because it's not the setup from here and I think having the setup at the deal and we could have there could have been a similar setup you know I, I right and I think maybe there was anticipation we might have more of a crowd than we did but I think that would be you know possible and we could even have an overflow room if we really had a packed room here and it would just help with that audio and also because when we have these off-site any board meeting it's not live in real time right for the community so just you know a thought with that and consideration for that going forward but um, the other my, so my oh my but now to my question so mm -hmm. praise thanks my comment um, my question with regards to the mandatory 3% and the additional 3% reserves where specifically is that money you know held are we able to hold it in some sort of investment where we're getting the effects of compounding interest to it that's a fantastic question um, I'm going to defer to Colleen if she doesn't mind because she's Again, more of the accounting background, I'm sure Colleen, and again, 30 years in the district might have an answer. Um, I know it's a little bit trickier because, again, ending, ending fund balance isn't necessarily equivalent to cash, right? right? It's an estimate of budget what we'll end up with. So it's not necessarily cash. Again, we, we like to, Colleen always likes to clarify for me when I look at ending fund balance, she's like, I don't have, we don't have $40 million sitting in a bank right now. Correct. But cash flows is entirely different. Absolutely. That, yes, so as accounting nerds get that. And, yeah. And it's okay for you to self-proclaim about how you enjoyed the meeting. Like myself, I mean, as I tell my students, you know, as budget and finance people, we, we're self-proclaimed nerds, right? You don't have to self-proclaim as a nerd as I do, but. More than happy to self-proclaim <laughs> as a budget nerd. I, I, numbers are a lot of fun. Exactly. So, um, so, but that that is, you know, and I, I do get, so everybody is understanding it's n the difference. And Colleen could probably speak to it, how it is not necessarily representative cash on hand. Correct. That we could just run down to the bank and pull out. Correct. But so where does it sit? How does it sit? And because there is a difference between the mandatory and the additional, and are is there a way to put that where it can be invested so we could reap the benefits of compounding interest, even if it's just held for the additional? So we have the cash that we have right now is in cash and county. So it is at the county treasurer, and we do get interest on that. Interest um, on it, the cash. On the cash, company. yeah. Okay. Budget, we can't really get interest on because it's anticipated money. We don't always get the funding. Like we will get, let's just say, $46 million in an apportionment, but that comes monthly, and we have monthly payroll. So it that amount that we set aside is money that we're not spending in the budget but that we um, don't necessarily have in cash and the only thing that we can compound interest on is cash that we actually have and that is in the cash and county and we do get interest on that uh, so on those funds so even with the additional it's not what we could really do right it, it's more budget than it is budgetary cash. okay mm -hmm. but cash we do get interest on perfect thank you so much you. and i just wanted to to add i've i've had a lot of um people reach out not just from our district but people you know or, or who have a, a vested interest in our but like just talk about the quality of that presentation and the deeper dive and i just want to thank our staff for uh, doing their best to accommodate the board's request to have that at the alternate location. Um, so we have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you all so much. All right. Moving on to item 9.4 uh, SELPA local plan, budget, and service plan. Presented by Heather Gorman. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and again for the last time, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. 
So as the last two people presented on June 14th, there was a public hearing. The last public hearing was for the special education local plan and local budget. Um, I present to come tonight to ask um, that you approve the budget and the service plan. There were no changes made to what was presented on June 14th and all of the information is attached to um, the the agenda. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. We have one, Sean. So I guess you could say I'm making the last day count. I'm still here. So, um, so again, my name is Sean Henry. I'm a school psychologist. Um, very much uh, long time school psychologist here. Uh, very much value things um, and again it might just be the cancer for me but I want to give out um, shout outs I was gonna say for Casey um, it was great um, it was great to ask the questions mr. Serpa sometimes uh, you ask questions it's like a softball to show what what's known there and so um, Casey really showed an understanding of, of the um, not just the importance of the data of what it meant is that obviously everything is about early intervention um, but also showed that um, the importance of the data early on and why why later on it's a good sign that we're not having a problem there and this goes under special education so I'm not just talking about something else because early intervention for special education is is if a child is not reading by third or fourth grade we can go into data and stats galore about prison and all these different things and so <clears throat> we need to identify special education or children with disabilities at an earlier age. But the way to do that is not to test every single kid. The way to do that is to provide quality interventions because what we need to do is sort out from the low achieving students and the at risk students from the ones that truly have a disability. So if we do earlier interventions and we put the things into place, we can provide every kid the reading instruction that they need and when we don't see in response to intervention when we don't see what we should expect to see then we can start to tailor it in terms of doing true empirical MTSS where you start giving more interventions at an earlier age and by the time we've done all those different things we know the kids that really have a disability and we and we test the kids and get them the services earlier that they need and we don't do a whole bunch of testing for students that don't need it and needed quality instruction or quality interventions but did not get it. So uh, that's my time here and I'll come back for something else. Any other speakers? Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Sure. Go ahead. I think we have to have a second first, then the discussion. I think that's a point of order. If somebody could second, and then we'll have further discussion. I can, we've, we've, al we've allowed discussion in between the first and second. Uh, just a few questions and comments. Um, you know, thank you for coming up with the budget. I know we have a lot of questions about SELPA. And the inner workings, but just a quick, quick couple of questions. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to support programs like the Rise program? Getting more assistance for special ed e hall. I know I've been in discussions with constituents regarding the need for more instructional aids at Radcliffe. Um, you know, to help out, you know, the Rice program at Watsonville High School. And I heard in the, from a constituent in my area that. His son was going to Rolling Hills, and he said that there has been instances when they're trying to cut IEP times from an hour to 45 minutes. Um, how do we plan in the future to address these kind of issues? Okay, so there's a lot of questions there rolled into one, I think. Um, so one of the things I believe you asked about was how were we supporting with um, personnel for some of our programs? Um, I think this year in particular, we've worked really um, closely with um, HR 
and we've had several job fairs that have been very successful. Brian has talked about them a few times up here. Uh, just yesterday or the day before, I think we interviewed six um, either IAs or BTs, and we have been hiring people as quickly as we can and making sure that they're qualified and getting them into place. Um, so I think we've made a very huge dent, not that we've totally filled everything, but we've made a huge dent in um, some of our classified um, vacancies. So I think that's been really good. I do know that with programs like the RISE program, um, you know, we have an excellent teacher in CC over there. Um, we have three behavior technicians that work with her program. And I understand as a teacher, I taught for 16 years, that it's challenging when you have a grade span, first through fifth grade. Um, and, you know, even though her numbers are lower, if she has seven to eight students and three BTs and herself, looking at how do we support that and all of the kids' curriculum and their recess time and PE. So really um, looking to be creative um, with her. I know I've talked a lot with Heather Morin, who oversees that program, about what different things that we can do within staff at the site. Um, there is a mild moderate program over there, so looking at are there ways to separate students out and um, support you know, some of that grade span. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further, uh, Trustee Scow? Yeah, can you uh, explain, um, is it policy to reassign aides to different schools? Like I've heard one of our aides is going from one school to another and she doesn't want to leave that school because she's developing, why, what's the rationale, why is it that way? So all of our instructional assistants are assigned to special services as a department because we do have um, a variety of needs with both students and program. So as students move um, from one grade level to the next or if there are one-to-one -one aides or students move out of the district, numbers change within the classrooms, we have to look at the programs as a whole and our personnel and cover the entire district. So we're not just a site, you know, we have all of the sites within the district. So we have to be um, looking at who is the best fit and what is going to be the best service for the students. That's really our focus. So as we make decisions, that's what we're thinking about and we're trying to make sure that we're covering the student needs. And sometimes that does mean that we have to move personnel. Anyone else? I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. You have a first and a second? The microphone was suddenly very close. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. All right. Um, going on to item 9.5, expanded learning 23-24 school year budget, contracts and site services agreement. Uh, report will be presented by uh, JBL, or JLB, I guess. <laughs> Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Apparently, I'm JLB, Director of Expanded Learning, and I'm pleased to present to you tonight our Expanded Learning 23-24 school year budget, contracts, and site agreements, all at one time, so I don't say JLB to you, six times back to back to back. So for Expanded Learning Opportunities Guiding Principles, we have our um, principles that we are looking at, and I'm just noticing for some reason they all say one now. Um, so providing <laughs> equity access and opportunity, ensuring engaging academics and social emotional learning, prioritizing cultural specific and culturally responsive programming, commitment to youth voice leadership and value to build upon students, staff, and family community partner. And this year, I've had the privilege to come up and share with you guys many of the things that we're doing in these guiding principles. So if we wanna look at our timeline, last year at this time, Dr. Rodriguez presented on our timeline, I think at the same meeting in June. And so we will be going into phase three, the green phase. And so what we plan to do is offer the same programming that you have seen this year, doing breakfast club, our TKK, early programs, intercessions, summer school, and after school programs. We also hope to 
continuously expand our morning breakfast club programs that have been successful at our elementary schools and move those into our middle schools and high schools as we're able to with staffing. This is a little tidbit of our budget. And so what this breaks out is the different programs that we use our funding for. And so what I want to remind everybody um, is that our funding is ESSER, which is one-time funds, 21st Century, ELOP, ACES, and assets. So none of these programs pull any funding from uh, general funds. Actually, we're trying to work closely to see where we can help with things that may have used to been used in general funds that actually happen after school program. And so I'm really excited that we're able to do that and work closely. This is a snapshot of the programming that we propose to do this school year. So these are the same programs that you saw this year all year long, our after school program, our breakfast club, our intercessions, credit recovery, summer school, Parro Passport. In addition, there's some programs that I have not talked to you guys about this year, such as our MESA program or our Aptos Junior High drama program our um, Kiwi Kits, um, CKC at Valencia, and Outdoor Science School. And so these are just a snippet of the different programs that we hope to utilize our funding for to ensure that we are making the guiding principles and also the ELOP program, it's not a grant, has compliance um, regulations. And so these programs ensure that we are creating a nine hour day. Actually this last year, most of our sites ran 11 hours a day of programming. And we were required to have 30 intercession days. I believe right now we're at 60 intercession days. And so we have really ensured that we are doing not the bare minimum, we are rising above and beyond what most other districts are doing right now. And so I ask that you approve our program plan so that we can ensure that we are able to offer these same services and beyond next school year. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Sean. So again, my name is Sean Henry. I wasn't planning on actually being here still at this point, and I wasn't planning on speaking to these different different things. But um, one of the things that's been a benefit or a good thing um, is that when I come to these things, I learn and I listen. And so even I, even though I may have an idea of what I want to say, um, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to basically integrate what I'm hearing. And it's not just for me to come and, and be heard; it's to listen. And so I just want to say how great this is to see and something for our district that. We're bringing in extra resources for students and these things are badly needed. And that's what we really need to be talking about is with our limited funds, how do we best spend them in the general budget and how can we get more funds? And uh, if anybody knows having a family budget, you can only get more resources by doing extra jobs and different things. So you have to figure out how to spend the money in the best way and get the most bang buck for, for the buck. And so for this district, it's, it's about getting quality people and keeping quality people. And so this is all really, really good because this is what our community needs. We need extra opportunities after school. We need different things. Um, but we also need to have make sure we have the backup. And I'm not saying that they're not doing this, um, but just the scientific mind that I have um, of making sure that sometimes these programs aren't just babysitting or different things, that we actually do really, really quality things. Because when we have the kids in there, they're going to co keep coming back. And sometimes you have programs where the kids and the families don't use them because they're not actually doing what they're saying they're supposed to do. And so that's what we talk about, like efficacy. Of like, Are you doing what you say you're doing? And all these things, and I'm not questioning any of these. I know these are all great. And so I've seen some of the high school, different things like that. And so as the board, that's where you guys come in and you ask those questions. Those questions are really, really important. Um, because then the, then, then the community knows what's important and also becomes more aware. So, um, so sometimes when you're voting, if you have no questions to ask, that's okay. Just like me, you shouldn't be talking seven or eight times at one board meeting, but you should have questions because that's your role. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? 
right. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Can I have a motion to approve? Do I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. I have one abstention. Any opposed? Motion carries. Having a moment. 601. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, moving on to item 9.6, visual and performing arts at elementary level. The report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez and Allison Niazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of uh, Human Resources. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm, uh, oh, what? Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> that's too an achievement for me. <laughs> it should be on, yeah. So I'm gonna kick things off with the, with uh, Sylvester, this, this slide. Yeah. Yeah, so as we continue the discussion about our VAPA program, I think um, some things we want to highlight um, that we discussed that I know at our special board meeting, so I'm going to re reemphasize them again for you tonight, but also um, key in some other points. Oh, PowerPoint thing here. Yes. Is. Um, is that our intention for our visual and performing arts program is to have music for four, music for 45 minutes for all students, um, either K5 or K12, or K12, K5 or K6, um, as well as visual arts for our like K2 to K3 and continuing our science release um, at the elementary level. So as we've talked about at the special board meeting, how that breaks down when we take our total enrollment of our students and how we kind of come up with our formulas for how much staff we need at the sites. Um, we start with the number of students, um, and then we break it down based on grade level spans, right? So we have kinder through third that are 24 to 1, and then we have fourth through fifth or six at 34 to 1. Um, and so you can kind of see as the examples we provided previously, but again, for, the, for everyone here tonight in public, that um, when we break down the student enrollment, it gives us a, you know, 15.8, 13.58, 12.3. That's not... We can't always run a program. Kids don't come in perfect packages of 24 or 34 um, in the different grade levels. So what we do is then we, based on the grade levels and based on the way that the students kind of at their ages um, work out in numbers, we then allocate FTE for staff. Once we've determined what their total staff allocation is for the classroom, we then break it down a little bit further. Um, and that is what we need for release. So in the contract, we have a CBA in the contract that has how many minutes per week um, the different grade level spans receive. Um, and so then we take that number. So like, for example, a Mesty, we have a Mesty McQuitty in Rio. So a Mesty is going to have 18 teachers next year, which equates to 1.8 FTE. What they're currently staffed at is 2.8. So you can see we have a whole extra FTE of a teacher there um, at that site. Same with McQuitty, they're over, they're over, and same with Rio. So what we are trying to do for the next school year um, is to not have disproportionate amount of overages at all sites. And we were trying to even them out to make sure that our programs are also equitably accessible to all of our students. So music, music, art, and then science or P, depending on the site. Um, so if we were to keep our our sites overstaffed, um, it, would, it would cause a little bit of an issue because we would have too many people and not enough minutes for them to complete. So this broke down um, the minutes for a MESTI. So there are 1,525 instructional minutes available. Um, and what teachers actually teach are 1,405. Um, and then 120 minutes of release. So that's what the students would see. And then four through six, it's 1,375. So if you see then if we kept... Um, a MESTI at the same FT allocation and release, they would only be teaching about 868 minutes. So you can kind of just start to break down the numbers of where the overages are and what, what they would be doing. Um, and then what that translates to in just a whole entire day, so if you take those 1,525 minutes a week that students have for instruction, this is how it breaks down with all of the, all of the different subject areas. So if you'll see um, with all the language arts, designated ELD, SIPs, math, science, PE, SEL, music, art, library time, life lab, all the instructional program that we have for our students, that's what it looks like kind of within a day. Um, so I know we've talked about having extra or having more, more um, allotted for our students. It, it's going to be a, a challenge um, because there's already so many other things competing for the same amount of time. So kind of breaking down the numbers in that way for you. Um, and that also doesn't take into account, as I noted, like any transition time. So obviously kids are not jumping from like one subject to the next. There is some time in the day to like walk in and out or switching from ELA to math. Like there, there is transition time. So this is what it would be like if you had zero. 
um, which we know that doesn't happen. So um, that's that part. And then you know, this is the last slide. You did one of my slides. Thanks. Oh, I did. Oh, sorry, I started going. <laughs> yeah. So I think something that was mentioned. We just wanted to reiterate, but something that was mentioned before is. We have the we do have the possibility of um, needing to still identify if we if it is supplement or supplant. So that is still something that is very important because as was mentioned in the special board study session, I'm just mentioning it again for for just reminding people and then also some people may not have heard is that we if we wind up having it stated that it would be supplanting by using that that means that we would have to pay back that money so then it would not be something that would be good our auditor said that it was possible that we could show that we were going to reduce and then use that money but it doesn't actually take out the second portion, which is that the school site is required to do a plan and to have school site input, um, including school site council, ELAC site leadership. As was mentioned by Colleen, we don't even have it in the budget at this moment because we don't even have a line code for it, right? We don't have a funding code for it. Um, and then one of the things that is required is that the people who are involved in the site understand that this funding is available for all the things that it's available for. Remember that this is just a small list of that. It's not an ongoing list. So the question is, is can we eventually use Prop 28 in order to have these positions? One, it's going to be where, where are we going to fit it in, one. Um, but then two, the question is um, whether or not um, the site itself wants to, what it wants to choose. Um, and most likely, as was mentioned before, um, that amount will not equate to a full-time position. So the concern about having um, two, two sites will continue um, throughout Prop 28 as well because except for the high schools which are receiving significant funds because it's by number of students um, then um, most elementary student most elementary schools are not getting enough um, or I don't think there's any that are getting enough for a full-time person um, but that might happen but we do need to do it once um, the plans are released from the state and once we actually can um, put that within the budget. Um, and so as requested, the board requested that we bring this back um, for um, action again. And so um, I continue to state that I believe that it is possible but that we are acting prematurely if we do not wait until Prop 28 is solidified. <coughs> All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we, yes, we do. We have five. I'll call you up by three. Christina, Lucia, and Eileen. Good evening again. So I was here a couple weeks ago, and um, I'd like to address the use of the term buzzword equity, which is important, right? But I think it was being confused with equality. Um, equality means that each individual or group is given the same resources or opportunities. So for example, all schools would get a 0.5 art teacher or all schools get the same specialty teachers, which is not something that I think is best at all. But equity recognizes that each person or group has different circumstances and allocates the resources and opportunities to reach an equal outcome. So I'm an MSD teacher. For MSD, equity would mean recognizing the importance of having bilingual arts teachers to support our K-3 dual language program so that all students actually have access to the arts. Equity would also mean that we honor the community relationships that have been established between teachers like Lucia um, students and families because those community relationships are what sustain all of our passion for education whether you are an educator or a learner or really we're all both um, and additionally 
this um, this community relationship piece, I guess, is an area of growth for us in the local performance indicator reflection report. So something to keep in mind. And lastly, our community is unique because, as has been mentioned before tonight as well, we have both an SDC and um, the RISE Therapeutic Program on our campus. And um, Lucia has taken the time to uh, relationship build with our students and to learn strategies to serve our special population. And I appreciate her for that beyond measure. Thank you. Um, and it's splitting her time really is going to take away all of the extra projects and family outreach and time with students that she is able to currently give um, give to our students. So please consider equity when considering changes to our visual and performing arts programs. Thank you so much, you guys. One thing to remember is that uh, not this year, but the next year, we're going to have four uh, full day kinders. So keep that in mind. You're going to take somebody and you're going to have to put somebody back. Um, good evening, board members, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. I don't know what is going to happen with me, with my position for next year, but I want to thank you all for the time you spent listening and discussing this item, especially to board member Bolaño Scal for opening his eyes and to uh, and ears to the community he represents. Thank you very much. I fight really hard for what I love and believe, and that is my family. First thing, my son, my immediate family and my extended family. That means I'm messy their students, their families, and my amazing colleagues. I hope you understand that. You all understand that. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for the times you have opened your door and for listening to me and listening to my request. I wish you, with all my heart, the best in your new journey. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Eileen Clark Nagoka. I'm a retired teacher, and since retiring in 2020, I've continued to volunteer um, at H.A. Hyde and at MSD in kindergarten this last year. Um, so I am here to support um, keeping the arts fully funded, the, the visual art, rather. I, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the, the budget, um, as it was just explained, um, it sounds like there's maybe a possibility of continuing art um, full time for, uh, in elementary and, uh, uh, and uh, middle school. I, um, when I was teaching, I was, and we, we, we got art teachers, I was so surprised, you know, I was pleasantly surprised that um, what the teachers were teaching was, was not what I was considering art at that time, you know, something that was, Easily reproduced and it followed a model, um, but they, uh, but you know, art teachers know so much. They they talk about techniques, they talk about color theory, they talk about art history. It really is an academic um, pursuit, um, academic subject. Um, so I, I hope that you can find a way to continue to um, support full time art in in all the elementaries and um, and. Uh, um, middle schools and also um, I had the opportunity to um, teach some art, simple art classes um, in kindergarten at MSD this year and it's just so, it's so powerful, it's so um, soothing and so engaging and I really applaud the um, emphasis on mental health that PVUSD has had the last few years and um, uh, if nothing else, it's a, it's a great investment in mental health for, for the students. So um, I just want to add my voice to please continue uh, visual art fully. Thank you. Our next two speakers, Martha and Sean.
Hello, my name is Martha Vega. I'm here to speak as, as a resident. I live in District 2. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, um, for, every, for your years of service to PVUSD and to wish you the best um, in Stockton. And um, my heart goes out to the board. You, you'll be making a decision on this action item. And so I wanted to thank you for being here and um, having this item um, being discussed. I was here um, at the last meeting and I was able to hear some of the speakers um, and I'm here today to let you know I'm a product of um, the PVUSD. I was able to be a student at McQuitty School and I played the saxophone. Um, and I continued on into middle school um, at EA Hall with Mrs. Camacho and played the saxophone as well and went on to Watsonville High with Mr. Smith. And as I'm sitting here, I was like, I remember they made a positive impact in my life and I remember their names um, to today. And so, um, and, and when it comes to, I'm grateful that we have Proposition 28, and when it comes to save the music, I love music, right? But I also love art, and art started when I was in kindergarten in Santa Ana, which is where I was born, and I know that's where you came from, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. And then we came, I transitioned over to um, Watsonville at, uh, when I was in second grade. But um, art comes in different forms, right? Um, dance, we did Baile Folklorico in McQuitty School. And um, as you're discussing the budget, and I have 14 seconds, you indicated that uh, there's no funding code. I don't know what funding code existed back then when I was growing up and coming to school here. So I love the array that proposition has, and I hope you somehow incorporate that in the schools. Thank you. Uh, I'm here again, Sean. Um, again, wasn't planning on speaking to this, but actually when you come and you listen, you learn. And first thing I wanted, to, I think it was a student who came out, and there was a couple students, and I'm so glad that they got engaged and they came out. Um, and uh, the first student, uh, I believe she was a student, I'm just, everyone looks young these days, so I'm sorry if you might be a teacher or not, <laughs> and young. Um, but I believe it was a student or a college student or somebody, somebody young. Anyways, coming out and getting engaged and actually coming and speaking about you know, different important things and different concepts. Um, and other speakers, they spoke about fidelity. And and so I I thank all the, the trustees, because um, you're in a really hard job, because there is basically a smorgasbord of everything we want to do, we need to do, and should do, and we have to figure out. And you all have to make tough decisions. So um, one of the first things I, I appreciate is, is uh, when you listen and everything. And even, there needs to be a little respect for even people that you know, I was going to give a compliment to Bill Beecher and he left and I was like, well, maybe he'll get it because other people saw my announcement. Um, you got to, even though I don't disagree with him in a lot of ways and, and how information is presented and I think is really wrong a lot of times, I got to give it to him for the passion and the commitment to come out here every time. And the same thing with Marilyn. It's not just because I have cancer. I hope she's wrong because <laughs> we have, we live in this technological world and, and, uh, but if she's ever right, um, whether she's right or, or wrong, you got to give her respect for having that passion and continuing to, to speak about what she believes in because she cares about the community. And so everybody that comes here deserves respect because they care about the community, whether they're students, parents, union members, administrators, whoever it is. Um, we all are on one team. And, um, and hopefully part of that team can have art um, because there's no, um, the science of art is basically, it actually creates neurotransmitters. It's, the research is really, really good. And it's no, it's no coincidence that all geniuses almost always played music. So we need to teach our, every one of our children like they're geniuses because it creates something in their mind and it connects to something. And if we talk about their learning, their reading, and their engagement, Art gives a place for kids, and gives a place for my kid. He didn't get the talents from me, but I'm glad it can be nurtured. All right, any uh, discussion from the board? Uh, yeah, I wanna thank uh, the speakers who have come out um, and the concern from the community, and also the passion 
for the arts and the visual arts, we've, as I said before, and it's obvious, we have a very rich um, culture of visual arts in, in the Pajaro Valley. And the community that's been leading that movement and is growing, frankly, is not happy with the current plan. And I'm not gonna stay here. I, I have the magic solution. It is obviously complicated. And we wanna have music. Uh, certainly I wanna have music, I'm a musician. But I, I, don't, I wanna figure out a way to do it without coming at the expense of art. And so I know that the arts community has been deliberating solutions, trying to figure this out, understanding the complexity of release time and these other needs. So I don't, I don't pretend, I don't think we're gonna have that solution t tonight, but I think that we should continue this and knowing we're gonna have an interim superintendent coming pretty soon, give that person the opportunity to work with the arts community to figure something out um, positive. So I just wanna thank everybody involved. Um, I would make a motion that we, that we continue this item and move it to July 26th so we can keep this dialogue going and uh, give the opportunity to the new, uh, the interim superintendent to engage with this as well because it is complicated and it deserves a lot of input. Um, do we have any other discussion? In Trustee Flores? I have an you know, really appreciated all of our discussion about this because it is such an important um, thing for us to really dive into. Um, I agree that, you know, like what Dr. Rodriguez says, until we really know what's going on with Proposition 28, you know, there's not a whole lot we, we can do as I don't, I don't feel like we should make any concrete decisions regarding that, those funds until we know, you know, how they can be allocated. Um, I did, I know at the last time we discussed this, some items that came up was, are there enough minutes in the day? So I did appreciate that slide that um, said, you know, this many minutes for this, this, this. Um, and so if that's one of the arguments, is there's not enough minutes in the day. Um, I know that the art could be used to teach English, to teach social studies, to teach history. You can incorporate an art project in that. So you're still getting that subject, but incorporating a visual art with it. So that's one way to incorporate those minutes. It doesn't have to be this or this, it could be together. Um, also with, you know, teacher release time, you know, we, were, we heard that, you know, we're gonna have too much teacher release time, teachers will only be working 800. There's no th nothing saying the teacher has to be released. There, I, the students can benefit with having the teacher there along with an art teacher or a music teacher or a science teacher. And, but all of this is, you know, of course, if we have the budget to do that. Um, so ideally, yes, if we can find the budget, if Proposition 28 can help us with that, I think it would be amazing for our children to have all these opportunities. So, but again, until we know what we can do. Um, I have a few questions. One, um, what are the schools that currently do not have an art instructor that would be getting art instruction through this plan? Rio and Mar Vista. Okay. And um, what would be the impact? No, I think she's asking which ones would be getting it that don't currently yes. have it. Not oh, which sorry. Ones aren't going sorry. to have it. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I don't want that off the top of my head. Yeah. I don't know that it's necessarily adding art. Let me get my phone. Let me look at my phone. Yeah, no, it is. It's adding to schools that just like where um, where Lucia would be going doesn't currently have it. So that school is getting art, and they wouldn't have it. Well, they, right. They did. Ann Soto had art this past school year, and the person resigned. So we're, it, yes, so then they would have it back. Okay. Correct. If we went with just, like, trying to allocate the release based on like attrition which is what we typically do with mm -hmm. teachers and, and anything in general they wouldn't have it for next year you're right but because we're splitting them and um it does allow us so yeah what would the impact be of not uh, of tabling this for our future meeting impact like to to the district to me to the department to, to, to the programming oh it's already been done so mm -hmm. we've already given assignment notices mm -hmm. the plan that we've talked about about reallocating our FTE mm -hmm. as evenly as possible across all of our elementaries is is in motion mm -hmm. so if the board chooses to wait till prop 28 gets more clarified we're, we're good 
like in terms okay. of operation and in terms of programs moving forward. We've already, we had the MOU that we approved mm -hmm. last board meeting on how to, you know, support the art teachers that are going to be splitting. So we're, we're good in that regard. All right. And do, when do we expect, do we have any expectation on when we'll hear about Prop 28? So in the budget, Newsom actually passed SB 115, which actually clarifies quite a bit of how to utilize Prop 28, also how they will take back potentially Prop 28, how the sites will need to um, administer the plan. So I haven't been able to dive into SB 115, but it sounds like that's some of it. The big piece we're waiting for is really CDE, and then also as Colleen and I have noted, the auditors, because we can assume a lot of things, but if an auditor turns around and says, you didn't use these funds the way that CDE is now giving us in the audit, we potentially have to pay back those dollars and um, potentially lose the dollars that we would have had from Prop 28. I think to Dr. Rodriguez's point, the biggest thing that we know for sure is that sites need to develop a plan. So each individual site needs to say, and then to the piece that's on the screen now, that funding is available for all of those different items. So a site can choose that they want to try and add computer coding, they can add animation, and Prop 28 would support that. And if that's what their, their school and their community wants to do, it, it would be in the best interest to support that as that's what Prop 28 was intended to do. So, um, you know, so the acting superintendent, the interim superintendent would still have the discretion, which is, you know, part of, you know, to make staffing decisions, you know, to proceed as normal. But we would be able to continue our discussion about the direction overall. It wouldn't have, like by tabling it, it wouldn't have an impact on the functioning of the district. No, I mean, what that would mean is it would basically be status quo. So the what was presented to the employee, um, their assignment would continue to be their assignment. What I will say is that I don't believe that we're going to have much more information between now and the July 26th board meeting. I understand that there's urgency to keep the conversation going, but I do not believe that that would happen. And I will say that there is impact. That's why I was asking you to talk about staffing, because if we don't move people and we, we still have to provide coverage for release. So that means we would need to hire more people. So you are putting, that's why I wanted to talk about staffing. Oh, so well, you, I didn't they know are you putting meant that. you in a bind yeah. if on, if you make a decision late and close to when school starts, um, and you move people, they are providing coverage, which is a collective bargaining agreement requirement. It is going to cause some challenges. Now, if you do it with foresight and you say, okay, we're going to do it starting X date after we hire this person, then that's not a problem. But if you don't do it with foresight, then you will cause us to basically violate the contract because we will not have enough staff to provide the required minutes of release time. That's what I was afraid to. When I Sorry, I thought you meant what we'd already done. We're, we've already reallocated, so we're good that way. But if we don't do that, that yes, that would be a, that would be a problem for us. Okay. Okay. So, any further? I guess in light of that information, I'd like to second Adam Scow's, Trustee Scow's motion. Costa, did you have something to add? I think I'm more confused. Um, oh, help me. Um, okay, a couple of clarifying questions I did have. Um, with regards to this Prop 28 monies and um, it being allocated based on ADA, and it's site-specific, right? You I, I, this is the lumping of the, of the three contemporary high schools together, the lumping of our middle schools, the lumping of our elementary schools together. But each school, so like, for instance, just in the, the, um, the agenda item, says an example of 7,000 to new school, 405,000 to Watsonville High School. So the district can't take control and charge of that and lump it all together and disperse it across, yeah. right? So it is going to be site specific for sites to decide um, how they use that. And so I'm really confused now. I'm sorry about the 
because the assignments were given out. Mm -hmm. But are you saying if it goes forward with the motion that's on the table now that we're not by delaying it, that we're putting our, our, our HR team in a position of not being able to hire and put people in rooms that they need to? So let's say on July 26th, you guys make the decision to change current staffing. Then that would mean that there are some elementary sites that do not have all of the coverage for mm -hmm. release because you now have the current problem that we had this past year where you have some sites that have a lot of extra release time and you have some that are just skimping by. But if you were to take the example for example, the MSD example, and keep that at MSD, so MSD has too much release time, and you're taking from another site, the site that you're taking from, that point five, would not have enough release time. And so if on July 26th, if it's just moved forward to continue with it as planned, then there's no problem. Then there's no problem. But if there's a change to try to go back to what it once was or some like other image. 23 staffing. Then it creates a problem. That's correct. And I also truly believe, I mean, I understand that it's good to have, continue the conversation. I do not believe that you're going to know by um, July 26th. Also, we're going to, we want to hire a lot of music teachers. That's a great, we don't even always know how hiring goes either. This is why I understand the Minty teacher was told one thing and then is now being told another thing. So we put things on paper and things change and adjustments are made at the last minute. It's, it happened at McQuitty last year to a kindergarten, to a fifth grade teacher. So I'd, I'm not saying all I would ask for in my motion is that we continue the conversation, see where we are. and. I think the arts community is, there's no question they're a little disappointed in, in how this has unfolded. I would just ask the board that we continue the conversation, keep it alive, keep it current, and, and we'll figure out some, and we'll see what we figure out. Maybe nothing changes, maybe some, a small change happens. You know, I guess I'll, I'll I mean, we, we came, in this district, the budgets were so bad we had no art and no music. So it's just, it's hard for me to swallow down that like we have, we're giving both now and that's somehow wrong. Like we, we can't afford to have a full-time art and a full-time music teacher. We can't afford it and we can't afford the instructional minutes. Like where are we going to put those extra minutes? And then what about science pullout? and release, like science is really important people, super important, and for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, at least at a couple of my schools, they're getting science as their release. That's very important to me and to our society. So, I mean, it's, it's like, I, you know, when I started this, I'm the board member that brought forward the release time, like those K, was not, maybe not K, but first, second, and third grade, teachers weren't getting any release time. Like I brought that forward because the Valencia teachers really felt like it was unfair that the upper grades got release time and they didn't. And so we, we, we fixed that with the help of the union, you know? And, um, and so now we get to have both, but the, somehow that's not good enough. You know, it's just like, it's amazing that we get music at every campus, it's unbelievable. Kids can't, be in band unless they start in music in the early grades, but somehow this board has made it like it, like it's a, it's wrong or something. So at and I will also say that it's not about just visual arts. Look at all those other arts up there. When I was the art coordinator for my kids' school, we did a lot of these things. We didn't just do visual visual arts. We did theater. We put on productions. We did dance. We did music. We did a lot of different things. So anyway, right. we, we have a first and a second, and then we're at 11 o'clock, and we have 14 more action items, and we have consent, and we have to go back into closed session. So is it a quick? Quick thing is we, we don't have art for most of our fourth and fifth graders at PVUSD. 
at, and that's another problem. All right, so we, if we're, let's, we have a first and a second. This conversation, if depending on how the motion goes, this conversation can continue. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Uh, yes. So all the all those in favor of continuing the conversation at the July twenty uh, sixth board meeting? There. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. I'm opposed. All right. Motion carries six one. All right. Um, and staff, please be mindful that we have a lot to get through. Um, and we only have an hour left. So, 9.7 school plans for student achievement. Uh, Michael Berman. I have the opportunity to present the school plans for student achievement. Um, to be brief, this is based on our, our cycle of continuous improvement with the ultimate goal of students achieving their greatest potentials, including reaching state academic standards. It started last year where you approved the current SIPSAs for all the schools, and it comes back after analysis, monitoring, and looking at data and making decisions about what that data says, creating next year's uh, school plans goes through um, site leadership, the ELACs, the English Le Learner Advisory Committees, ultimately to school site councils, where they take the input from ELAC and make a decision on what to amend, what to change, what to keep, and what to move forward in their school plans for the following year. Um, the goals are tied to our LCAP goals. Um, every site has at least four. Um, one is an achievement goal, one is an English learner progress goal, school culture, and parent and family engagement goal. Um, next steps are to, uh, uh, you know, upon approval, um, to start implementing and then continue to monitor and look at data to see how our student achievement and our, and our metrics uh, go throughout the year. And, as has been requested, all schools have um, prepared a slide for you with actual growth data based on their current goals and the next steps that inform their follow-up goals for or their goals for this current year. I'm not going to go through them, but they are there for you all to um, check out. That's it for me. Any questions? Thank you, Michael. Um, we do have one speaker to this item. Sean? Again, this will, be, this will actually be the last thing I did, so I've, I've been up here seven times, so I've probably taken about 15 minutes of your time, but uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Serpa said before this year, she hadn't seen me when we did the School Psychology Week and speak in a long time, and, and I hadn't been here for several years, and so I guess I'm going to get all these out of my system. So um, in terms of student achievement, um, one of the things is, is, and you can't pay for everything, you can't do everything. But on the budget, one of the things I was really coming to talk about was the budget and special ed and other things, but didn't you know, they're going to happen. Anyways, because um, I listen and I hear what's going on here. Um, student achievement, it's, it's always about the money. I mean, it, I mean, schools are always about the money. Like, what money do we have resources for? So on page one of 141 of the budget document, it shows that our we're increasing our um, total... Um, reserves are increasing from 59 million to 76 million this year and 3% is 10 million now there might be a real big reason like 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 um, declining enrollment and all these different things but I hope each one of you trustees know why we're not spending that money on some of these things that are time sensitive in terms of small instruction all these different interventions because once that time passes for those kids that's done and so to make sure you know exactly why and how much of that money we have, because we have $66 million over the $10 million minimum reserve. Now, I'm not saying there's not rainy days going to happen in the future, but in the past, we've been told the sky's falling, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. And then later on, it was a good fiscal decision to buy this building. 
but we were saving up for something bigger and the community didn't know why we were having these big reserves and every year as we were basically saying we're having deficits we're going we're running in deficits and every year more money would go in reserve that wasn't used on students so make sure you all know why you have a 66 million dollar thing and some of the things we possibly could do 10 15 million dollars more spent could take care of some of these things not everything but make sure you know the finances thank you very much god bless you and and uh, carry on the good work Do we have any public speakers to this end? I would guess that was the public speaker. All right. Any questions or comments from the board? I, I just feel like I want to elaborate on that comment because I believe there's only two of us that are on this board that was part of that decision making to buy this building. And I just want to address that um, in clarity that we did that at a cost neutral situation with what we were paying in rent. That was uh, definitely direction that we gave the superintendent and the then CBO. Um, and I do believe it's just the two of us that are left that made that decision. And so I just want to make that sure we weren't being fiscally irresponsible with that. We were actually being, I think, a little more fiscally responsible. Um, so with that, nothing else. I just wanted to provide clarification on that and I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Is, um, 601. Um, item 9.8, resolution 22-2359, regarding the 23-24 <laughs> Education Protection Account EPA. Clint, it's you. Thank you, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. I will try and go quick as I know we're time sensitive and Yvonne's already trying to kick me off the podium. So, um, yes, I have the resolution for our education protection account. Um, unfortunately, as much as this sounds like this is additional funding for school districts, um, once again, the state has found a clever way to say we give you additional money solely for from this education protection account, which came from Prop 30 and actually came from one of the um, from the additional increase to taxes. But really all it does is it off, it's an offset to our LCFF. So they still determine here's the amount you get because you got this money from EPA, we just lower the amount we will give you from the LCFF um, calculation. So unfortunately this is not additional money, but it is um, money that has to be spent on specific uses. For our district, what we have done for, for now about eight years um, plus is we use it on certificated salaries and benefits. So this resolution is for the board to see that that is where we're spending the dollars um, to confirm with the state that that's where the EPA money will be spent. So with that said, I would like the board to approve this resolution. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. <laughs> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. Thank you so much. All right. Um, item 9.9. .9 uh, J13A, request for allowance due to emergency condition school closure due to state of emergency. Uh, Good Dr. evening, Ivana President Alcaraz. Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Dr. Ivan Alcaraz, the Director of Student Services. So as a district, we are expected to um, have 180 days of instruction. Um, Any time that the district has to have some dates closed because of an emergency, as you recall, we did have some of our, our campuses closed in the month of March uh, due to the floods that um, affected and impacted the schools. So some of the conditions that were actually caused the closures were the county or city evacuation orders, the county or city evacuation warnings for um, roads of restriction access, as well as national weather uh, service flash warning. So what this form does allow us is allow us to actually receive the funds for the days that we were actually closed. And so I, I kindly request that you approve the J13 form as presented to the board. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? We do not. Any questions or comments from the board? Make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Next up will be um, at 9.10, approved side letter between PVSD and PVFT regarding Delta Dental. That's Allison. Yes, thought. thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So I have a side letter tonight for you um, in collaboration with PVFT. 
So as you all know, we've closed negotiations. So a side letter is kind of making an agreement after the fact. Um, we have we experience some. We'll see some savings um, for our dental plan. The premiums are actually going to go down, and so what we're going to do is take that savings and we're going to buy up the plans for all of our employees. So as you can see right now, the annual um, maximums are in the black for all the different Delta Dental plans we have, and they will be moved to the green um, with the savings we're seeing because of our premiums going down. So I requ respectfully request that you approve this side letter. Any public speakers? We have none. Any questions or comments from the board? I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. And moving on to item 9.11, approved side letter between PBSD and CSEA, also regarding uh, Delta Dental. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This is the exact same side letter for our other bargaining unit. As you know, we've also closed negotiations with them, which is what warrants a side letter. So it's the same thing, same annual maximum, and um, I request that you approve the side letter. All right. Any public speakers? We have none. Questions or comments from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601 and continuing our groundhog theme. Mm -hmm. uh, 9.12, <laughs> approved Delta Dental uh, annual maximum increase for professional services, confidential and represented and management employees. Yes, thank you again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this is then the same um, maximum, annual maximum for all of our professional services, confidential employees, unrepresented and management. So I request you approve this as well. Any public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. A first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Six <laughs> what? Uh, item 9.13, approve job description early start teacher. Allison, it's still Yes, you? thank you again. Um, so this is a job description for you. If you'll recall, when we settled negotiations with PVFT, it, for our early start teachers, we negotiated additional days because the program that they offer runs into the summer. In order to do that, we also needed to do a job description. Um, so that is what is before you tonight, is a job description for the early start teachers that work at Duncan that provide the like in-home services because their program extends into the, into the summer months. Um, and therefore, we needed a separate job description to denote that. So this is kind of the tail end of that piece of negotiation. So I re respectfully request that you approve this job description. Any public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right. Going on to 914, I approve job description instructional coach dual language. Yes, thank you again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This is a new position to the district. Um, we have curriculum or instructional coaches. This one is now going to be in Michael Berman's department, working uh, specifically with our dual language program. So we don't have an instructional coach currently that is dedicated to dual language. Um, as you know, we're expanding our dual language program to Rolling Hills, and we're planning on you know expanding that beyond in the district. So this um, position will be very integral in that. Um, support, so we respectfully request that you approve this new job description. Thank you. Public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a, a motion and a second. All second. those in favor? Oh, yeah. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um, we pulled item 9.15, so we'll move on to 916. Approve resolution 22 Cal Shape Program. And Clint, we're back to you. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees. And for the last time, I'll ever say Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I actually almost forgot I had this item, but then I re realized, so I was able to save this for the last one. Um, so, not my slide, but yeah. No, no, not this time. 916, perfect. So um, many of you may have heard about um, AB 841. I know I've been asked about it quite a bit for about the past year. Um, this is the assembly bill that actually was established in conjunction with uh, PG&E to establish and the California Energy Consortium to actually establish ways that districts can utilize um, grant funding from the state to uh, fund specific energy projects. Um, one of the big ones was HVAC. At the time, 
uh, we were hoping that we'd be able to actually install new HVAC. That is not the, has not been the case up until just about now. They're moving into their next phase, which is going to actually allow the installation of HVAC and um, being able to actually go after those dollars and go after those grant dollars. Those grant dollars will be up to $6 million for our district. So it's definitely something we want to pursue. In order to do that, we have to have done assessments and we have to actually have CO2 monitors in the sites in which we would look at doing HVAC improvements. So what we're asking for tonight is a resolution that states we will actually go after the assessment part of the grant, which will include a vendor coming in and doing assessments of all those sites, all of the HVAC, as well as installing um, additional CO2 sensors for all of those rooms in which we'd be providing new HVAC. This is not a contract at this moment. This is just the ability to allow us to go after the grant. So with that being said, I ask the board approve this resolution. Thank you. Public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you so much. All right. Item 9.17, approve uh, EB Design Studio Inc. Uh, architect Agreement for the MSD Elementary School MPR Siding Replacement Project 2024-006. Fernando. Good evening, President Home, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Elindo Fernandez, and I'm here to ask for the approval of this architect agreement for the Amesti Elementary School NPR siding replacement. This is an ESSER project. The project is estimated at $500,000. And I'm asking for the approval of 72500 72, to go into contract with EB Design Architects for their help on designing a biddable set of drawings so we could go out to bid for the Amesti siding NPR project. Thank you. Any public speakers? We have none. Any discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 9.18, approve 19-6 Architects Agreement for the Ansoldo Elementary School Studio Project. Um, Armando, it's still you. Good evening once again. Um, for this project, this is for Ansoldo Elementary Studio Project. This is a, this is a major rail project. This project is estimated at $100,000. And I'm asking for the approval to go with Maddie 19-6 Architects so they could do a biddable set to go out to bid for the Ansoldo Studios. The amount of this project for their work would be $15,000. So I'm asking for the approval to continue the project. Thank you. Public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item uh, 919, approve EB Design Studio, Inc. Uh, architect Agreement for the Diamond Technology Institute Roof Coating and Awning Project, 2023-11, uh, and report still here. Good evening once again. This is um, the agreement for the architect, EB Design Architects. This project is estimated at $115,000. For their work, it would be $16,675. And this is an ESSER funded project. And I'm asking for the approval so we could continue with this architect with DB Design so they could help us with the biddable set to go out to bid Thank for you. this project. Public speakers? We have none. Discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. I'll motion. make a motion. Okay. Second. Okay. I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, going on to item 920, approve EB Design Studio, Inc. Uh, architect Agreement for the McQuitty Elementary School NPR and Site uh, Siting Replacement Project 2024-007. Good evening once again. This is um, a architect agreement that we want to go into with EB Design so they could help us with the design of the NPR replacement siting project. This project is estimated at 500000 and for their work would be $78,000. This is an ESSER funded project. I'm asking for the approval so we can continue the agreement with EB Designs to help us with this project. Thank you. Uh, any public speakers? We have none. 
Any discussion from the board? I have a question to approve. Sorry. Uh, trustee, I'll second, question? but I do have a, I have a sure. question. Why do we need an architect to replace siding? This, so they could come up with the scope being that we're replacing the siding. We could encounter a lot of dry rot. We don't know what we're going to encounter once we open it up. Okay. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Right. The first and second. Just a quick question or comment. Are they going back with, are they going to spec out Hardy Backer or what kind of site are they going back with? E yes, we're going back with Hardy Work now. Okay. No wood. You get rid of the wood? Yep, correct. Thank you. And I, I just also want to add that I appreciate you saying the, where the funding comes. That's great for have, having all that on the public record. So thank you. You're welcome. All right. We have a um, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, item 921, uh, approved notice of award for the Pajaro Middle School HVAC Replacement Project 2023-0022. Oh, two, two. Um, take it away. Good evening once again for this last project that I'm uh, wanting approval for. This is for the Pajaro HVAC Middle School Replacement. This is an ESSER funded project. This project's estimated at, oh. Sorry, this this is a, a notice of award for Power Middle School HVAC project. This this project was um, on February 10th and February 17th. The district advertised this project for the Power Middle School HVAC replacement. A mandatory bid work was held on February 21st, 2023. Two contracts were present at that on March 16th. 2023, the district received one sealed bill from the following contractor, Premier Builders, with for the amount of $323,382. I'm asking for the approval to continue with the contract with Premier Builders for this project. Thank you. Public speakers? None. Discussion from the board? Just a quick question. So is Premier HVAC contractor or are they general? They're a general contractor. General. So it's an HVAC project, so do they have three or more trades to cover the bid? Correct. They do? Yeah. Okay. Is that a motion? And with that, I'll approve it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a first, do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. I just wish Herlindo and his team a very wonderful, busy summer. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for all those reports. Thank, thank you. All right, item 9.22, amendment number two to joint powers agreement with uh, Santa Cruz County and Rio Del Mar playground project proposal. That will be presented by Rich Ariano. All right, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, two parts to my item this evening. Uh, the first part is amendment number two to the uh, joint powers agreement that was originally approved back in 1978. Amendment number one was approved in 1994 to renovate the playground. Amendment number two will allow Santa Cruz County to contribute $50,000 to the uh, second renovation of the shared, uh, or the recreation and playground space that's on campus at Rio Del Mar Elementary School. Um, included in the item is uh, the renderings of the playground and I ask for your approval. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have none. Any discussion from the board? Is it going to be wood chips? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Is there any thought, you know, I put in the playground no. for kids with disabilities and I was hopeful that we could continue to do that. What was that? That wasn't the agreement. It was, it was supposed to be the, the rubber. It was not the wood chips was not which um so part of this agreement is just for the playground structure um i oh, so wood chips the is consistent will come across. later or something yeah that would be separate yeah. from yeah because we'd like kids in wheelchairs to build a roll right up to that playground i'd also like us as a district to think about putting adapt adaptive equipment there so ada approved playground structures that was my request 13 years ago. <laughs> and After, so, yeah, so, so they do, I, if, you, if you look at it, it does have um, some landings that are available to that, but that was something specifically we talked about having it be 
and now I can't remember the name of the of the, the material material at the bottom but um, we had talked about doing that because it's also safer than the wood chips and it is then commensurate with what is happening up top um, so um, I I didn't check this part because that was what was agreed upon and was in the original documents that I sent to you. Was that, I don't know, it's not after turf, but, but anyway, so if it's not that, then I think we should pull this item yet again because that is not, um, it's not what we had agreed upon with the, with the, uh, with the county. So I'm sorry, we'll have a request that we pull this item. It's not the conditions that um, we had agreed upon. Mm -hmm. Do you want a motion to that effect? Um, if we could table it until the next board meeting, please. Okay. Um, the 26th, we'll need it for the 26th. I'll s make the motion to table this to um, our July 26th meeting to get that for the clarification. And I think the clarification is just about the- Surfacing. The surfacing. Okay. Right. It, if it's if they're two different things, unless it's a mishap, then what it is, right? I need a second. Oh, I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, seven zero. Okay. Um, consent agenda. Um, do we have any public speakers to consent agenda? We do not. Are we there do not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? All right. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda as is um, presented. Second. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. I have second. a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. And we will um, close our open session and re return to closed session um, to finish up those items. All right, I'm reconvening our open session and we'll go on to um, item 13, our action and report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, we do have some items to report out of closed session. So um, on closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on June 28, 2023 with 34 and six additional action items and I need a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> in closed session item 2.4, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on June 28, 2023 with seven and three additional action items and I need a second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Okay. Um, and oh yes. And then we have and then we have um, three announcements. Bahara Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Dali Dalilia Hernandez to the position of assistant principal at Bahara Valley High School. Dalilia has been working as an administrator since 2005 in a variety of capacities. She has served as an assistant principal, summer school principal and dean of students. She holds a BA in liberal studies with a bilingual education emphasis, a single subject credential in Spanish, a master's of arts in education, and an administrative credential. All these degrees and credentials were obtained from California State University, Stanislaus. We are pleased to welcome this highly qualified administrator, PVUSD, Go Grizzlies. Welcome. <laughs> Announcement number two. Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Daniel Andres as the new principal of Pajaro Valley High School. Dan started his career as an English and Spanish teacher at Paso Robles High School and has since served as an assistant principal, director, and high school principal. 
Dan holds a Bachelor of Arts in I'm sorry, Dan holds a Bachelor of Arts in English secondary education with a Spanish teaching minor from Brigham Young University, as well as a master's Master of Arts in Education from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He also holds an administrative service credential, a bilingual authorization in Spanish, and a single subject teaching credential in both English and world languages. We are excited to welcome this highly qualified administrator to P PBUSD. Go Grizzlies. Welcome, and our last announcement, uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Dennis Todd Wilson as the new principal of Renaissance High School. Todd started his education career at Rolling Hills Middle School as a language arts social studies teacher. He has worked at Lakeview as a PE teacher and most recently at PV High as an assistant principal. Todd holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Physical Education from Fresno State and a Master's of Arts in Educational Administration from Concordia University. He also holds an administrative credential, a single subject PE credential, and a multiple subject credential. Todd is a graduate of Watsonville High School and has spent his entire career in PBUSD schools. We are excited to have him move home into his new role, Go Dragons. All right, um, so our next meeting is a regular board meeting on July 12th. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at 11.43. Go team. <laughs>